A warm welcome to all of you once again. Today's expert talk is about LTBI. It's a state of permanent immune response to simulation by mycobacterium tuberculosis antigen without causing reactive disease. On our journey towards achieving targets of WHO's NTB strategy, successful implementation of LTBI guidelines play a key role. Today's expert talk is aiming at creating awareness among clinicians with regard to this. Now, may I cordially invite Dr. Vinya Aryaratna, President, Sri Lanka Medical Association, Dr. Nirupa Pallavatta, Acting Director, National Program for Tuberculosis Control and Chest Diseases, to grace us at the head table. Firstly, let me kindly invite Dr. Nirupa Pallevatta, Acting Director, NPTCCD, to deliver the opening remarks. President SLMA, Dr. Vinyari Ratna, Past President SLMA, Professor Jennifer Pereira, and other SLMA officials, President elect College of Pulmonologists, Dr. Bodhika Samaravikrama, all consultants, medical officers, ladies and gentlemen. Very good morning to all of you, and I would like to welcome you all for this very important and timely technical session. As you all know, our country has pledged to NTB as an epidemic by 2035. New strategies has been developed and new initiatives were taken to achieve this target in line with the global NTB strategies. National policy up to 2022 was to treat active TB only. Preventive treatments was limited to contacts of sputum positive TB patients below five years. Uh, below five years. And PL, P people living with HIV. And with the new NTB targets, Health Ministry along with NPTCCD has taken a policy decision to further expand latent TB management to improve, uh, to include more high risk categories and its successful implementation depend on the knowledge and uh, skills of the healthcare professionals. This seminar will provide you valuable information on epidemiological, diagnostic, and clinical aspects of LTBI and programmatic approaches of implementation. Your presence here today and active participation in this important academic session is greatly appreciated, and I wish you all a great success. Thank you. Thank you, Madam, for setting the tone for the rest of the morning. May I graciously call upon Dr. Vinya Arya Ratna, President, Sri Lanka Medical Association, to address the gathering. Thank you, Surani. Good morning. Uh, Senior Professor Jennifer Pereira, past president of SLMA, and all the other um, resource persons who are going to take part in today's uh, seminar. Uh, members of SLMA and all, all the uh, participants who are uh, attending this, uh, this session today in person and also I like to welcome all the uh, participants who are joining online. Sri Lanka Medical Association this year has taken the theme towards human healthcare, excellence, equity and community. We all know that our healthcare system should be very humane. We as doctors start uh, our journey practicing medicine taking the Hippocratic Oath in the various forms in Sri Lanka it is a, a pledge with the Sri Lanka Medical Council um, they are we uh, the first principle that we adhere to is provide the optimal care to the patient in a most ethical way so 
we decided that 2023 particularly when the health sector is facing an enormous crisis due to the economic downfall and the uh, shortages of medicines and also now with the um, potential threat of our human resources in the health sector being uh, migrated to other countries. So in this context, we thought that we need to remind ourselves, the doctors as well as allied professions, of the importance of providing compassionate or humane health care. And also the three themes, sub-themes are excellence, equity and community. Excellence means excellence in all forms of health care, from preventive to treatment, clinical uh, services to rehabilitation as well as palliative care. So this expert talk series is really uh, in it's focusing on the excellence of care. So we know that if you look at uh, TB, it's one of the most uh, important infectious diseases of all times. And particularly if you look at the, uh, the statistics last few years in Sri Lanka, I think uh, 2021, there were more than 6,000 cases. 2022, it has increased to 8,340. And probably it is a situation where reporting was also uh, down. So actual number of uh, cases would be much more. And also uh, it's a, one of the leading causes of death as well. So I think as SLMA and also those of you who are involved in caring, particularly uh, uh, the uh, respiratory diseases and others as well, uh, important that we remind ourselves of the best of practice at this time and we are we as SLMA Sri Lanka Medical Association very privileged to be able to partner with the uh, NPT CCD and I would like to also acknowledge the support uh, given by uh, uh, Dr. Pallavatta, Dr. Nupa Pallavatta, the acting director uh, and also uh, agreeing to partner with SLMA and also the uh, College of uh, Pulmonologists and the Sri Lanka College of Microbiology. So I am extremely privileged that we are able to hold this important seminar uh, as part of the SLMA expert talks and I wish to thank everyone who was uh, involved in uh, organizing this and I wish the deliberations all success. Thank you. Thank you very much sir for your enthusiastic collaboration. Now, this brings us to the key item in the agenda this morning, the expert talk. Without further ado, may I cordially invite following dignitaries to grace us at the head table. Dr. Onali Rajapaksha, consultant community physician. Dr. Bandhu Gunasena, consultant respiratory physician. Dr. Chinta Karuna Sekara, consultant microbiologist. Dr. Niranjan Disanayaka, consultant respiratory physician. Dr. Bodhika Samarasekara, consultant respiratory physician. Dr. Ishant Pereira, consultant respiratory physician. I take this opportunity to bring your attention that the LTBI guideline 2021 with LTBI screening algorithm can be downloaded using the QR code displayed outside at the registration table. Thank you. Now, may I invite Dr. Onali Rajapaksha, consultant community physician, to enlighten the gathering under the topic of Ending TB, LTBI Programmatic Implementation in Sri Lanka. Thank you, Suvani. Uh, a very good morning to you all uh, who are physically present here today, as well as those who are joining with us virtually. Right. 
So uh, ending TB in Sri Lanka by 2035. Uh, that is the current goal of the National TB Control Program in Sri Lanka. So uh, in re uh, reaching these targets, and TB targets, as mentioned earlier also, it's very important that we implement the latent TB infection program very successfully in the country. So uh, this is actually a famous slide. Uh, this uh, uh, tells what latent TB infection is. It's the presence of mycobacterium tuberculosis organism in one, one, one's body, but without signs and symptoms or radiographic or bacteriological evidence. Nearly one-fourth of the global population is uh, estimated to be infected with the bacteria, but only around 10% will go on to develop the disease. And it is said that around 5% will develop the disease within two years after the infection. But this is for the general population. When it comes to immune suppressed groups, the risk of developing the disease would be much higher. For an example, People with HIV infection, the annual risk will be around 10% per year. So in this slide, I have summarized some of the data uh, on TB at global level as well as at the local setting. Uh, the estimated incidence of TB at global level uh, for the year 2021, it was estimated to be around 10.6 million TB cases. For Sri Lanka, for the year 2020, the WHO estimate was 64 per 100,000. And it has been uh, that value for uh, several years. But for 2021, it has reduced by one to 63 per 100,000. So the estimated number of cases will be around, or rather was around 13, 1650. So when it comes to reported cases, globally for the same year 2021, it was around 6.4 million. For Sri Lanka in 2021, it was around 6,700 cases. So the incidence rate was around 29 per 100,000. This is against the estimates. So uh, for 2022, uh, we have detected uh, over 8,000 cases, 8,340 cases, so nearly 1,500 increase uh, compared to the previous year. And the incidence rate has gone up by around 10 per 100,000, so it's around 39 per 100,000. When it comes to treatment success rates, Globally, for the year 2020, it was around 86%. For Sri Lanka, in 2020, it was 83%. And before that, actually, it was around 84, 85% mark, which is very good for the country. But for 2021, uh, TB patient cohort, it has dipped to 79%. And on the other hand, the mortality, deaths due to TB, Globally, when it's around uh, 1 million, uh, 1.5 million for 2020, in Sri Lanka, death rate has been on the rise. In 2019, actually, it was around 7.2%. Death rate means number of deaths reported uh, out of TB patients. So out of 100 patients, TB patients, nearly seven TB patients died. So this increased to 7.6% in 2020 and in 2021, or for 2021 patient cohort, it has risen to almost 9%, which means nearly one in 10 TB patients die in Sri Lanka. So uh, PLHIV, uh, people living with HIV who were started on preventive treatment. Globally, for the year 2021, so it was around 59%. And here in Sri Lanka, 
for 2022, it was around 49%, a uh, decrease compared to global level. So uh, children below five years, uh, household contacts of bacteriologically positive TB patients started on TPT. Globally, for 2021, it was around 32%. Here in Sri Lanka, we are performing much better. For 2021, it's around 62%, and also for the year 2022, again, 61%. So uh, we were talking about NTB targets. So uh, it's actually a global commitment. There are three main indicators, reducing deaths among TB patients, reducing number of TB patients, and also maintaining zero catastrophic costs among TB affected families. So uh, the baseline was 2015 and five yearly targets are determined at global level to reach NTB by 2035. So when this is applied to Sri Lanka, reducing TB incidence, reducing TB deaths and maintaining catastrophic cost due to TB, this is the picture in one slide. The baseline of incidence, 65 per 100,000. We have to reach 10 per 100,000. In the yellow box, you can see we are still at 63 per 100,000. TB deaths, again, uh, we have to reduce it down to 32, around 30. And catastrophic cost, actually, we don't have a baseline in Sri Lanka, but the, there is a survey which is ongoing, which uh, the results of which will be out very shortly. So uh, this slide shows how the LTBI uh, management uh, is uh, linked to NTB targets in summary slide. This is actually a slide by WHO. Uh, according to that, uh, with the uh, trend that is going on, there will be around 1.5% reduction of TB annually, which is the red line at the top. But if we are to uh, fully implement all the uh, services uh, that we have, then we might uh, reach a 10% reduction by 2025. But still, we are not going to reach NTB targets by 2020. 2035. So that's why there is a need to do something new. What WHO proposes is maybe introduction of a vaccine or maybe new drugs or a prophylactic treatment. So if we, that's the point uh, for introducing LTBI management also. And if we do that, we'd be able to reach NTB targets by 2035. But this slide was prepared pre-COVID. That also we have to remember. So uh, the TB preventive therapy, the policy prior to the uh, guidelines, implementation of the guidelines, uh, the isonized preventive therapy, uh, we used to give uh, TPT for children below five years of household context um, of sputum smear positive or the bacteriologically confirmed PTB patients after carefully excluding the disease. And among P PLHIV also for the close contacts of uh, bacteriologically uh, positive patients after excluding disease. And also for the others who are not the contacts, the HIV patients, uh, it varied actually. Some did MAN2 and after uh, excluding active TB, uh, if the MAN2 more than five uh, treatment given or sometimes irrespective of TST. So LTBI guideline development. This was initiated by WHO in 2014. Uh, they developed a guideline which was published in 2015 it was actually a brief guideline. Uh, based on this, they developed a revised version in 2018. 
and this guideline was more comprehensive, identifying the relevant risk groups. So uh, following this, Sri Lanka also, National TB Control Program, along with the College of Pulmonologists and the other colleges, initiated development of uh, latent TB guideline in Sri Lanka. It was initiated in 2019 and published in 2021. So uh, this is available at NPTCCD website also. And today also we have uh, displayed a QR code. Uh, through that also uh, you can access it. So in this guideline, the key risk groups identified uh, one was people living with HIV, second group HIV negative but close contacts of a person with pulmonary TB, not bacteriologically pulmonary TB. The third group was HIV negative other at risk groups. So under this there are two subgroups. One is uh, those who are due to their clinical condition, those who are at risk of TB, latent uh, TB. Patients initiating anti-TNF treatment, receiving dialysis, preparing for solid organ transplant, or hematopoietic stem cells transplant, or patients with silicosis. The other subgroup is those who are at risk due to their environmental condition. This included prisoners, healthcare workers, immigrants from high TB burden countries, and people who use illicit drugs based on local research evidence according to the guideline. So in Sri Lanka, because of our limited resources, now when I mentioned about the guidelines, WHO recommended it for high income, uh, mainly high income countries and uh, middle income countries with an incidence less than 100 per 100,000. So uh, Sri Lanka might not be in par with those countries when it comes to income, but we also have an incidence below 100, so we are also low burden country. So at that point, um, implementation of this uh, LTBI management in Sri Lanka was also uh, taken as a policy decision, and uh, we decided to implement this in a phased out manner because of uh, resource limitations and other uh, logistical uh, factors. So uh, here, the phase one, we initiated phase one uh, in January 2021. So uh, other than the already included groups for TPT, in this phase one, we uh, in, uh, included all pediatric cases below 15 years who are close contacts of pulmonary TB patients. Then again, adults who are 50 years or more who are close contacts of pulmonary TB patients. Then we continued with PLHIV and also small proportion of clinical risk groups. So uh, now uh, implementation has been there for nearly one year, but uh, it has taken, uh, it was taken up in uh, different parts of the country gradually. And uh, once this is established, we'll be moving on to phase two and then phase three. Phase two mainly focuses on other clinical risk groups which is to come next, and then the other risk groups due to environmental conditions. So the uh, circular regarding this phase one was issued in 2021, December, uh, and this was disseminated among all healthcare institutions. As a summary in the guideline, there were seven um, algorithms developed I'm not going to talk about them because in the following lectures it will be uh, discussed at length. So um, what we have done during this one year, where we are at the moment, uh, the data at the national level, I must say uh, that at the uh, moment, this is not comprehensive data, but uh, with what we have 
at the program. Uh, uh, these are uh, what we have done. So the proportion, when it comes to context, proportion of screen context started on TPT by quarter in 2022. You see that um, it was about 10%, even going near 20% in the second quarter, but it has come down to eight in the fourth quarter. So this looks like that uh, initiating TPT has reduced uh, towards Q4. So when we analyze same data according to age group, here we see below five years, over 60%. Then five to 14, 10%, and 15 years and above, 6%. So uh, here what we see is that if the implementation or expansion uh, was more towards fourth quarter, and more elders were screened. What we have seen in our data, the positivity rates uh, might have dropped, which has resulted in re reduced uh, TPT initiation. So uh, the clinical risk groups. For clinical risk groups, also we have some data. Where when we analyzed, it has gone down in third quarter, but picked up in fourth quarter to almost 50%. So the challenges faced in implementing LTBI uh, program in Sri Lanka, one thing is of course at the uh, field level convincing individuals for TPT because they are apparently healthy people. Then other uh, one is compliance. Uh, currently, uh, the drug regimen we use is 6H, which is, which is isoniazid uh, for six months daily. So uh, sometimes compliance is also a problem. Then the other issue is provision of DOT for TPT also, finding DOT providers. As in uh, proper treatment, maybe virtual DOT, using WhatsApp, Viber, or some other virtual method is a possibility. And also, there is discussion going on regarding giving self-responsibility to consume on uh, drugs. So these are at the international level. When it comes to a local setting, I think more discussion is needed on these um, new ideas. Then other one is lack of resources. Especially, we are mainly using TST. So the patient has to pay two visits. First one to get the uh, test, and then second one for the reading. And also reading has to be done by a medical officer. So uh, there would be some limitations. Then from the patient side also, there are socioeconomic barriers, cost for transport, and sometimes who are daily wages, the loss of wages, also sometimes stigma, because uh, it's going to be uh, labeled as TB anyway. They are going to take drugs for six months, uh, so nobody's going to say this is prophylaxis or proper treatment. So still the stigma is also there. Then lack of resources for expansion in the future, because if you are targeting clinical risk groups, we'll have to uh, provide services for the hospitals as well. So uh, there will be huge uh, resource limitations, especially trained staff and logistics. Then sustainability amidst the current financial crisis. That is also a huge problem. Uh, best example is actually towards the end of last year, 2022, we were uh, facing uh, a lack of man to testing. So, uh, however, with strenuous efforts by the program, finally we were able to secure man to uh, vials. So, for the next year or even two, now we don't have to worry. So, way forward, mainly at the global level. So I thought these are very interesting. That's why I thought of sharing it here today. Uh, 
the CTB skin test. It's a skin test like Mantu and uh, the article, if you go through it, you will read that it's uh, the safety and efficacy of this CTB skin test is comparable to ICRA. So it's recommended for mass screening. This is at what is happening at the global level. Then development of TB vaccines. Vaccines for prevention of infection, prevention of disease, and prevention of uh, recurrence. So at the moment, there are around 15 vaccine trials and um, going on, around five of them in phase three. However, commitment or the financial support for the disease like TB is lacking globally. So even for TB vaccine development process, it has taken many years. Uh, if we compare a disease like COVID, it's, uh, yeah, you can see the difference. So that's why January this year, 2023, WHO has announced its plans to establish a TB vaccine accelerator council. So um, let's hope in the near future we we'll see some breakthroughs in that area as well. So um, with that, uh, I conclude my presentation. Thank you. Thank you, Madam, for that informative presentation. Next, let me invite Dr. Bandhu Gunasena, consultant respiratory physician, to deliver his speech on latent TB definition, algo diagnostic algorithm, and treatment options. Thank you, uh, uh, officials of the Sri Lanka, Sri Lanka Medical Association and Deputy Director Campaign. Uh, thank you very much for giving me this opportunity to talk about talk on this topic. And uh, ladies and gentlemen, friends, um, now latent TB infection is a situation where. Somebody asks you whether you have tuberculosis, you will say, no, I don't have. And if you ask, do you have, you don't have tuberculosis? You will say, no, I have. So you, you, you have no clear definition uh, about what is latent TB infection. Yeah, but if you are going to implement a national level program, you should have some form of uh, definition to go by. Uh, to select out patients who should be put on treatment. Now, uh, so what is latent TB infection? People who are infected with TB bacteria but do not have signs of active disease, they don't feel ill, then they cannot spread the disease to others. As you already heard, 10% of these people can go into develop active TB infection during lifetime. Especially the people who are having weakened immune system like HIV patients, who are people on anti-cancer therapy, dialysis patients, and uh, these people have a higher chance of higher risk of developing tuberculosis in, uh, as the years go by. Therefore, if you are going to treat these patients to prevent occurrence of tuberculosis, uh, you will have to first exclude tuberculosis, active disease in those patients. Not to have any clinical evidence or TB signs and symptoms. 
and also no radiological evidence you do a chest x-ray and if you are in doubt you may do a ct scan in few patients and no microbiological evidence of bacillary multiplication and also uh, supposing you do some biopsies there are no evidence sub sub suggestive of active tb uh, infection in those organs laboratory criteria i think my friend uh, microbiologist next speaker she will talk a uh, little more about this but just to keep the uh, keep my lecture intact i would like to tell few things tuberculin skin test is one want to test as we all know good old want to test and the new one is uh, interferon gamma release assay igra both tests will evaluate the type 4 hypersensitivity sensitivity against tuberculosis Mantra test: You have the patient has to come twice, once to do the test and then to read. Whereas IGRA is only one blood sample. But uh, it said one test is not preferred over the other. Both are more or less the same. Uh, and also, it will not tell you whether the patient has active disease or not. You just know the bacilli have have entered the body, and they would have had multiplication for some time, or maybe they are already dead. reading the man to you read the in duration not the erythema uh, the thick part of the skin is measured uh, after 72 hours and you know if, if it is more than 10 mm you call it positive man to reaction sometimes you may have to do two step test they are the initial test patient may not have come for the reading or you know the patient has some degree of immunocompromisation so you will go for the second test within 1 to 3 weeks and uh, if it's negative it will exclude latent tb infection but if it becomes positive on the second time you can consider it as uh, latent tb infection and treat provided that the patient does not have evidence of active tb and if you consider treatment groups people living with hiv is generally they are, they are they are generally given tb treatment uh but uh, so, sorry sorry if the if there's a it's a patient with hiv you are given prophylactic treatment generally prophylactic treatment after excluding tuberculosis but children less than infants less than 12 months are treated only they have history of close contact with the positive tb case and then um, uh children who ha- who had tuberculosis and were treated fully for tuberculosis who are hiv positive the question is whether they are they are supposed to get secondary prophylaxis after full treatment they are given Uh, they come from a high burden environment otherwise secondary prophylaxis is not generally recommended in uh, these children hiv negative people are also will be now in, in future included into the uh, treatment program ltbi treatment program they are close contacts of positive tb cases and also even if the patient does not have any contact with index cases but if they are risk in risk groups they are also given uh, isoniazid or tb prophylactic treatment those groups are people who are going to get immunocompromisation uh, bone marrow transplant and tb treatment and also the people who have high exposure for tuberculosis health workers immigrants from high burden countries illicit drug users so people who get immunocompromisation or who are going to get heavy exposure to tb uh tst tuberculin skin sensitivity is not essential in hiv patients and small children who are exposed to tuberculosis you can treat them 
even without Mahan to test. The decision is based on uh, the sputum results of the index case, so the high positive patient with close contact. And in HIV patients, the CD4 cell count and the duration and intensity of exposure. With that understanding, the guidelines, uh, the algorithms are prepared. And uh, first, if you consider adults and adolescents living with HIV, you will be. You don't have a laser pen, right? Okay. Uh, if uh, initially you will exclude tuberculosis by looking into the signs and symptoms, and if the if there's TB, you will treat them. When if there's no TB, then um, you will subject them to uh, you will subject them to Mantra test or uh, tuberculin skin sensitivity test. If they become positive, you will be treating. You will be giving. So, if there is TB, you have already treated them and if the, there is no TB, then you will do the mantra test and if they become positive, you will be giving preventive treatment. If they are negative, uh, you will consider uh, the um, other factors like their CD4 cell count and uh, exposure and if there is high risk, you will be again giving TB prophylaxis. But if they are not having TB, no amount to positivity and no high risk, you may observe them. The same, same thing, uh, the other arm. And uh, infants, with HIV and uh, also children uh, more than 12 months. Uh, in the case of infants, uh, you consider the history of exposure to TB. And if again, similarly, you screen all of them. And then uh, if there is evidence of TB, you will be treating. If there is no evidence of TB, you follow up and consider preventive treatment. So, again to recap, children less than 12 months with exposure or uh, other children about 12 months, you will be uh, treating them with, you will be treating with them, prevent, with, them with them with preventive treatment or if the patients had uh, some symptoms suggestive, you will if they, if they are diagnosed as tuberculosis, they are treated. If they are not having TB, active disease, you will consider again giving preventive treatment to them. That's children with HIV. Then we come to the household contacts of uh, immunocompetent household contacts of TB, TB patients. This is regarding children. Again here, uh, we don't consider MANTO TST testing in these patients. Uh, you will exclude tuberculosis if there's tuberculosis it's treated and if there's no TB, you will be giving preventive treatment. And if they, if they are not household contacts, you will do risk assessment before giving uh, preventive treatment. 
same thing if there's no tb you give preventive treatment and if there's uh, the, if the household contacts are given not uh, non household contacts you will do the risk assessment and if there's no significant risk you will monitor if there's significant risk you will be giving isoniazid then all the other adults who are contacts of index cases they are screened for tuberculosis and if there's tb obviously treat and then if they are not having tuberculosis you will again the adults are subjected to uh monto testing and if they are positive again preventive treatment is given and if they are negative they are observed so it's a bit of complication complicated looks looks complicated so if there's any is there any simple way of remembering so hiv children and non hiv the children who are hiv or non hiv tb contacts so that one category you exclude, exclude active tb and generally give, you give immuno uh, uh, you give uh, isoniazid prophylaxis that is general principle if they are non hiv and not household contacts then you ex ex assess the exposure risk so it's simple for children It's a bit of straightforward thing. You anyway try to give uh, prophylactic treatment if they are if they are not household contacts only. You will be doing a risk assessment. Adults, again you exclude TB. You subject the patient to monitor testing. And if they are negative, you observe. And in case of HIV patients, you do a risk assessment by doing CD4 cell count and the exposure and things. They decide on um, isoniazid therapy. so that's what uh, basically the gu guideline uh, if you don't go into so many ramifications straight forward i think as a practical point of view you can remember like this and then mdr tb of course if there are contacts of mdr tb patients to decide uh, to give prophylaxis is a bit of a difficult decision because you are going to use second line drugs i think that uh, has to be decided on case by case basis by the people who are do dealing with these uh, index cases depending on their antibiotic sensitivity which uh, is little uh, we need to develop our laboratory services uh, to that level uh, before making uh, clear decisions on these they have there are several treatment regimens proposed but i think in sri lanka we have selected two the 3 hp regime is uh, 12 doses that is 3 months of isoniazid and rifampicin where you give once weekly treatment uh, for 3 months that is 12 doses adults and adolescents about 2 years who are contact of pulmonary tb patients the commonly common one that we are currently using is isoniazid treatment for 6 months isoniazid treatment for 6 months which is currently being implemented and then um, <coughs> those are the two regimes that are available but not yet considered isoniazid rifampicin for 3 months so isoniazid rifampicin for 3 to 4 months now which patients would go for rp3 regime or that is rifampicin isoniazid 12 dose regime or which patient you will be using 6 months inh regime again it's given in the guideline adult adolescent living with hiv children living with hiv and uh, uh and adults and adolescents who are close contacts or tb the common the larger group is this 
and then also children who are contacts of uh, TB and uh, non-household contacts are suggested to have this regime and all the other patients who are going to get uh, immunocompromised state due to their various diseases they are having uh, and they are getting immunosuppressive treatment. Uh, I think this group is because the compliance issues, uh, this uh, regime is suggested. And uh, if you are using uh, uh, rifampicin containing um, prophylactic treatment in HIV patient, there's a, there's a small issue with antiretroviral drug. Non-nucleoside reverse translate inhibitors cannot be used with rifampicin group of drugs. So if you are using rifampicin isoniazid, you cannot use uh, NNRTIs, but except efavirenz, which can be uh, which can be given with rifampicin group. Protease inhibitors cannot be used if you are using rifampicin in your prophylactic treatment, but integrase trans transfer inhibitors are okay. I say that will bring to the end of my lecture. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, sir, for that informative lecture. Now, may I invite Dr. Chinta Karuna Sekara, consultant microbiologist to address the gathering regarding investigations in LTBI. A very good morning to all. So we are in the journey towards the elimination of tuberculosis. So it's my pleasure to talk on laboratory investigations or in a latent TB infection. So let's uh, talk about the importance of laboratory investigations in ruling out acute TB disease and uh, the uh, laboratory investigations uh, with regards to latent TB diagnosis. Mm, and uh, the most commonly used in tests uh, that we are um, in practice, uh, so TST or MANTU test, and tib uh, in IGRA or else uh, interferon gamma release in SS. And so I'll be talking on uh, uh, mycobacterium tuberculosis antigen-based skin test, uh, TBSTs as well. So it's quite uh, important to uh, exclude active TB when we are going towards the making diagnosis of latent TB infection. So it's uh, vital to uh, uh, choose the correct diagnostic investigations I and mean the diagnostic test and laboratory investigations. And we should be very careful about the uh, collection of transport and transport of the specimens that is to ensure the uh, quality of the test. So uh, meantime, so depending on the uh, site of the infection, maybe pulmonary or extra pulmonary, we should select the diagnostics test. So National Tuberculosis Reference Laboratory, Valisera, we provide uh, sputum microscopy, gene expert testing, for pulmonary and extra pulmonary specimens and solid culture that is LJ media and we also provide liquid culture by uh, midget or as uh, mycobacterium growth indicator tube automated system. Meanwhile we provide line probe assay for mainly for DST. So um, with regards to active TB so 
the quality of the specimens we are taking from the patient is quite important. Most of the time, we receive poor quality specimens that a patient may not be properly ruled out the active disease. So it's quite important to advise the patient not proper sample collection. Meanwhile, healthcare professionals should be aware about the, what are the investigations available for certain uh, diseases, I mean certain sites, maybe pulmonary or an extra pulmonary, and what tests uh, can be ordered uh, through the network and uh, through your test clinics and to uh, what are the samples that you can send to national level laboratory. For example, uh, for gene experts is the mo most popular test in TB diagnosis due to low turnaround time. Uh, but sometimes we receive unacceptable sample for gene expert. Rural fluid is, is not a validated sample for gene expert. So if there are high WBC count or if it's more towards uh, pus, we can do gene expert testing. But if it's more towards clear fluid, we are not in a position to do gene expert. Instead, we can provide liquid culture for plural fluid. But we always encourage CSF, pus samples, extra parliamentary biopsies, tissues, lymph nodes, and sometimes gastric fluid uh, in children for gene expert. So um, as a care providers, we should be aware, we should aware uh, the, what are the tests that are suitable for certain clinical presentations. So, uh, we are providing liquid culture for non respiratory samples so that lymph nodes and bone marrow samples and other samples, uh, plural fluid, you can send for liquid culture as well. So moving into uh, TB infections, as we discussed earlier, tuberculosis infection um, is characterized by the persistent immune response to uh, stimulation by mycobacterium tuberculosis antigen with no evidence of clinically manifestation of the disease. Still, uh, since we are planning for NTB strategy, it's very important to diagnose latent TB infection and offer treatment accordingly. There are risk groups that, that we can provide LTB testing, especially for close contacts and patient initiating anti-TNA alpha treatment, patient receiving dialysis, and patient awaiting organ and hematological transplant. These patients should be ideally be tested before the procedure. Because, uh, because most of the mm, laboratory investigations are based on the immunological reactions. Uh, so, so after starting immunosuppressive drugs, is a uh, uh, difficult to interpret such result. There can be some false negative result with the immunosuppression. So patients should be ideally be tested before the procedure. So other than that, patients with silicosis and certain other uh, risk groups such as prisoners and healthcare workers should be tested for latent TB infection. So typically using skin test or as we commonly called MANTU test is, is the one of the most popular tests that we are using in clinical practice. Uh, and uh, the interferon gamma release assays uh, available in private sector and um, VNTRA, National Tuberculosis Reference Laboratory, planning to provide this uh, test this year for patient management. And there are new tests coming such as my MTB antigen-based skin test, as well in, uh, in global settings. So uh, there is no gold standard test to diagnose latent TB infection, because uh, both uh, TST or MAN2 and NICRA test require an immune response. So uh, as we uh, talked earlier, uh, so there can be false negative results. 
also um, and it had the uh, to um, and to notice that uh, uh, the no this TST or IGRA or other test uh, we can't use as uh, as a reliable marker for development of the active disease later on in their life. And as we discussed earlier, uh, this is uh, not uh, for diagnosis of active TB or latent TB. So it's basically, you know, the depend on the clinical presentation, clear radiological uh, aspects and uh, all that. So these, uh, um, these uh, tests can't stand alone. So clinicians should be um, cautious uh, in interpreting these results. In majority of risk groups, a TST will be used alone, alone to diagnosis of a latent TB infection, so after excluding active disease. A specific clinical risk group, uh, both can be used, I mean TST and ICRA can be used uh, simultaneously, maybe one after the other. Sometimes ICRA can be false positive after TST, so um, if the TST uh, is negative, that is on the th third day of uh, performing the TST, we can take blood for IGRA on that day itself. So each test has its their own advantages and disadvantages. Regarding the Mantu test, as we all know of, so it's a um, it's a mainly depend on the person who is performing the test and who is reading the test. So uh, there should be a standardization of the procedure. There should be proper training and supervision and practice. Otherwise, uh, the interpretation of result is will be misleading. So cutoff value of TSC is. Uh, for immunosuppressed patients, we take it as 5 millimeter. For immunocompetent uh, people, we take it as 10 millimeter. So, TST or MANTO can be false positive. So, as we all know of, so infection with MOT or non tuberculous mycobacteria can give rise to false positive uh, MANTO test. And uh, previous BCG vaccination also can give rise to false positive tests. TST interpretation and administration also can lead to false results. So we should be very careful and the trained person should be attended during performing test and reading the test. There can be false negative results as well. Cutaneous energy is the condition when there is a infection had happened long time ago. So the immune system is weakened to develop such a induration. So that cutaneous energy is one problem of TST. Recent TB infection may not give the positive MANTO test because it will take at least 8 to 10 weeks to develop. Uh, the immune reaction. TB infection among elderly also uh, can give rise to false negative result and the very young as well. Some viral illnesses such as measles, chicken pox can give rise to false negative results because of the short term immune suppression. Vi live virus vaccination also can give rise to false negative results so that TST can be performed at the same dose, uh, day of the vaccination or else you have to wait for four, six, four to six weeks. And uh, so the TST is uh, highly depend on the person who is performing the test. So it um, should not be incorrectly interpreted. So what is a TST boosted reaction? Some people with infected with mycobacterium tuberculosis, they may have a negative reaction to TST it, if many years have passed from the infection. In that case, they may have positive reaction to a subsequent TST. That is because of the initial test stimulate their ability to 
react to the test. So we call that boost phenomenon. So this is, uh, that means the first TST can be negative, the second TST can become positive, but that is not the conversion of the test. That is, the, that doesn't mean that the patient acquired the uh, disease during th that time, that, but that, that is due to boost phenomena. So that is the basis for two-step TST. The two-step method is recommended at the time of initial testing for individuals in whom we, we are act anticipating repeated testing, or as in individuals uh, who are immunosuppressed. So in, in two-step TST, we can give second TST um, after an initial negative TST. So that second TST should be administered one to three weeks after the first TST. So uh, just to recap again, the two step is defined as the two TSTs, that is two mantles done within one to three weeks of each other. So um, in that case, so if it's a second uh, test is negative, so we can exclude latent TB infection. So if that second test is positive, we we can treat for LTBI infection. So let's see some details about interferon gamma release in assays. So it's kind of an in vitro uh, test when compared to TST, and it's, it measures the interferon gamma production by the uh, white blood cells. To perform the test, there should be reliable white blood cells. So the, the T cells previously synthesized to TB antigens produce high level of interferon gamma when re-exposed to the same mycobacterial antigen. That is the basis for IGRA testing. Uh, so that, uh, but uh, the IGRA testing uh, doesn't differentiate LTBI from, from active disease. So the, there are many, uh, there are two, three assays available commercially, quantiferon TB gold test, and the next version is the quantiferon TB gold in tube, and also a T-spot TB assays. What are the advantages of IGRA? So it requires single patient visit when compared to MANTO testing and result will be available within 24 hours. So, and it doesn't boost responses by subsequent test, and it uh, not uh, affected by BC vaccination or previous mort infection. Those are the advantages of ICRA in um, investigations, especially for latent TB infection. So there are some disadvantages as well. Blood sample must be pro uh, processed within hours. So IGRAs are not freely available in peripheral centers. So this is kind of a test more centralized so that collected blood sample should be transported to the national center or maybe the reference laboratory within few hours. Uh, so it's a challenging um, thing in our country. So uh, there's, if there's delay in transporting in the samples, uh, the, the, uh, there can be mis uh, result. I mean, the, the, the result can't be justifiable. So and the, there's, there are limited evidence on the use of IGRAS in children younger than five years of age and person recently exposed to MTB bacteria and immunocompromise because this is again based on the immunological reaction. So um, to interpret the result, patient should be immunocompetent. And on the other hand, it's a very expensive test. 
So uh, for mass screening, ICRA is not a possible solution in our settings. So this is the comparison between ICRA uh, quantiferon testing and T-spot testing. You can see uh, the um, difference uh, between ICRA and the T-spot testing. So, um, so both uh, tests are the based on the similar immunological uh, reaction and antigens. And uh, so in T-spot, we are counting the number of interferon gamma producing cells, whereas interferon gamma concentration is measured with the quantiferon testing. So there are uh, various methods of interpretation. Quantiferon can be interpreted as positive, negative, or indeterminate, but a patient should be immunocompetent to interpret the result. So T-spot is again in interpreted as positive, negative, or borderline, or invalid test. As with the TST, uh, then a positive result suggests that the, um, there's a TB infection previously, and negative result suggests that the infection is unlikely. An indeterminate result indicates an uncertainty. Uh, with regards to T-spot, borderline test result also indicate an uncertainty. So uh, there is no advantage of ICRA in uh, detecting active, active TB disease. So it's mostly for latent TB diagnosis. With regards to uh, cultures and other microbiological investigations, uh, we always encourage uh, to uh, provide suitable sample for ne uh, necessary investigations for exclude to exclude active TB disease. So this is a new era of testing for latent TB infection. Microbacterium tuberculosis antigen-based skin test or TSTs uh, have come into play. So. Um, it's a new class, so it's uh, evaluated by WHO now and found to be accurate, acceptable, feasible, and quite cost-effective. The uh, advantages of TST is that it can be used for mass screening because of the low cost. And uh, although uh, the immunological basis is similar to ICRA, so uh, the form of the test is more similar to TST or MANTO, which is more familiar with our settings. So uh, this is a very low cost test, promising test, especially in immunocompromised population. The, these tests represent an alternative to tuberculosis, T, uh, skin test, and interferon gamma releasing assays. Based on the available t evidence, WHO conduct that, uh, conducted that the diagnosis accuracy of t uh, TBSTs is similar to IGRAS and greater than that of TST. So this new MTB antigen-based skin test, based on the specific antigen, very similar to IGRA testing. So there are few commercially available assays. Serum Institute of India, they have introduced um, CTB testing, uh, and they recommend CTB in mass screening in diagnostic LTBI. And there are few more tests have been approved by the WHO, and there are several studies to prove their efficacy and safety in mass screening. So uh, TBSTs are uh, intradermal injection of antigens. It's the performance is, uh, of the test is quite similar to MANTO testing. So reading should be taken 48 hours to 72 hours after uh, performing the test. More reliable result can be obtained in children and immunocompromised patients, including HIV patients. So. Uh, Introduction of new, new diagnostic tools in diagnosis uh, 
in aiding diagnosis of latent TB infection is challenging because uh, the, uh, the such test should be have good um, accuracy and there should be a good epidemiological and geographical uh, settings uh, should be there and uh, we should con uh, consider the turnaround time, practical problems and uh, if a referral system as well, mainly the cost uh, implications and quantitative aspect of the results and the quality of the result should be ensured. During a test, we should standardize the test procedure in each space. During pre-analytical phase, we should be care, pay attention to proper collection and transport of specimen. And uh, during the analytical phase, we, are, we should be more careful in performing the test according to the standard methods. During interpretation, uh, we should be more careful uh, not to misinterpret the test, test and um, active TB or latent TB should not be missed because of the wrong result or misinterpretation of the results. Anyway, we are towards the NTB strategy by 2035, so it's uh, most uh, important to strengthen the diagnosis of latent TB infection. So um, it's, a, it's a clinician and other health professionals duty to interpret result uh, according to the risk scopes of the patient. Thank you very much. Thank you, Madam, for that comprehensive presentation. Now, may I invite Dr. Niranjan Disanayaka, consultant respiratory physician, to enlighten the gathering on latent TB infection in patients with chronic kidney disease and retroviral infections. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here at the SLMA again. And uh, first, I would like to uh, play homage uh, to some brilliant people, uh, my colleagues at my college, uh, headed by Dr. Shant Pereira, and uh, the College of Microbiologists, of which I'm probably a member in law and uh, College of Venerologists and other colleges uh, who have helped immensely in developing these guidelines with much, much deliberations. And uh, at the same time, Dr. Nirupa Pallavatta was always there together with her team of community physicians and doctors who supported us immensely in developing these guidelines. Hence, this is the final product of a lot of hard work. So today, uh, we, I'll be discussing about uh, latent tuberculosis infection in retroviral infection. And uh, it is important to understand why we are worried about HIV and TB. The main reason is that in, a, in the pre-HRT area, arena, we have identified that a person with HIV has about 20% more chance of developing tuberculosis. A person who is having latent tuberculosis has a 20% more chance of developing, 20, not 20% 20 actually, 20 times more chance of developing tuberculosis than a person who doesn't have HIV infection. Even after starting antiretroviral treatment, this risk doesn't go away. In a person who is being treated for HIV, there's about five times risk than a normal person with HIV developing tuberculosis. And during the last year, about almost one million people have succumbed because of HIV and TB co-infection. 
so we can understand the gravity of the co-infection of HIV and tuberculosis. And whatever means that we have to prevent, I think we have to use it in a very diligent way. Um, now these are the people who basically have latent tuberculosis. Right. So they do not have, uh, you know, there is a group of people that might not have latent tuberculosis. Hence, we had a huge, uh, you know, uh, discussion with the WHO uh, into, this is the 2018 guideline, uh, at the latent tuberculosis guideline, which is the almost one of the last guidelines that they have published, which says that if you look at closely, it says that adults and adolescents living with HIV with unknown or a positive tuberculin test and are unlikely to have active tuberculosis should receive preventive treatment of tuberculosis. And that is what they have saying. So in this, in this paragraph or the guideline statement, which is a strong recommendation and with high quality evidence, what they say is a person who is having a positive TST, I think there is no argument in that because that person, except in rare instances where there might be a false positive reaction due to non tuberculous mycobacteria, BCG vaccination, or false reading, this patient has the possibility of having latent tuberculosis. In, in a way, latent tuberculosis is a way of interrogating your T cells with a challenge of antigens that are there in the cell wall of a tuberculous bacteria to see that whether they have seen these antigens before. So we assume that if our immune system has seen these antigens before, there is a po possibility or a probability that the bacteria, the mycobacterial tuberculosis might be hiding somewhere in the body so that we can be given the disease when the T cells are dysfunctions due to various reasons. So here, in an unknown person, the T-spot, where there is an unknown result, we have identified that there is, in a patient whom we have not done TST, there is a 33% chance of developing tuberculosis. But if the TST is positive, it increases to about 66%. But if there is a documented TST which is negative, it is only about 14% that whom will be developing, going into developing tuberculosis. So we have a rather discrepant value. So, and later studies have shown that when the TST is negative, the giving preventing therapy might be more beneficial. Why is that? The main reason is that you can have a negative TST or negative test for uh, latent tuberculosis, right? Because it is any test is not 100% reliable. It might be truly because the patient doesn't have latent tuberculosis. That means even though this patient has HIV, there is a probability that this patient had been never been exposed to tuberculosis. Hence, the patient doesn't have underlying latent tuberculosis. So if we treat that person, assuming that this negative might be false, we are treating for a disease that the person doesn't have. I hope that you can understand what I'm saying, right? But at the same time, we have to understand that even though the TST or the IGRA and everything is negative, you can have this negativity because this patient's immune system cannot mount an appropriate immune response for the T cell antigen that we are introducing. Hence, we have cut down the positivity mark from 10 to 5, but even then, you might not be get a positive result because these patients' T cells and the immune, not only the T cells, we know that in HIV there's a huge amount of immune suppression happening in various ways due to the viremia and the T cell destruction as well as the, the inflammation that is happening in the cells. So this patient might have a false negative result. Hence, a person who is actually having 
latent tuberculosis or is harboring the bacteria inside his body, we might be not be catching it up. So it's a balance that we have to maintain. So that is why we, after much deliberations, even after having a discussion with the WHO, uh, you know, didn't want to accept this recommendation and we actually changed it that might be appropriate in our Sri Lankan context. Now, there is a catch situation here, right? If you say, even though they say to treat, uh, to ask us to treat all patients with HIV with latent tuberculosis guidelines. So if we go into the details, they have never told us to treat patients with negative result with latent tuberculosis treatment. They have said to treat unknown people only. So in a court of law even, we might not be able to justify ourselves with that. So hopefully I think we have established that point clearly. Because you know, any drug has consequences. Any drug has side effects. Any drug has interactions, especially we have retroviral drugs, which might have significant interactions uh, with the anti-TB treatment. And it's very important that we select the appropriate patients who will get the most benefit of being treated for latent tuberculosis and treat them appropriately without exposing other people to unnecessary risk of treatment. So hence, I would like to highlight the third recommendation of the guideline group. Even if TST and IGRA tests are negative, a team of, so here we go by a case by case definition. So if it is negative, we would like to know whether this negativity is a true negativity. Whether it is due to the patient has been not been exposed to a TB before or whether this negativity is because of the patient's energy or that means the inability to mount a proper immune response that the patient is having. So that might depend on various factors depending on the CD4 count, depending on the venerologist thought of how and there might be other factors, how immune suppressed these patients are. So if the venerologist says no, there is a probability that this patient's negativity might be due to the, uh, the immune dysfunction. Yes, we know that the risk then outweigh the benefits. But if it is not so, then probably it's not so. And at the same time, we know that Sri Lanka is not a high burden country, it's a low burden country. But in certain socioeconomic uh, groups, it's like in shanties in Gampaha, Colombo, and probably in the estate sector, we might have a possibility of a patient being recurrently exposed to tuberculosis, where the probability is high, than a person who is living in a good house with good ventilation. Right? So there we might have to think about the social determinants that might come into play, that might, we might have to decide on starting the patient on latent tuberculosis treatment. So that is the way that we have thought about in this guideline. So there is a rather different way that we have approached. So the, the final outcome will be that we will be probably monitoring depending on our guidelines after implementing the, this in a proper way to see in the next two years how things would go on. And if the evidence suggests that all patients with negativity or whether it's out positive or negative will be benefited, then yes, I think we should start on treating them. But at the moment, this is the thought process that is going on. Right, so this is the algorithm, right? And uh, our senior consultant, uh, Dr. Bandhu Sina, went through it, and uh, I just wanted to highlight some very important facts here. Now here, uh, any patient with HIV, unfortunately, the number of HIV patients, especially among men having sex with men, have been increasing, and some of them are defaulting. And uh, I had a recent patient who has defaulted for almost five years. So we are facing a, a problem uh, at the moment. So any patient whom we have HIV, this is what we call the symptom analysis, right? The four question analysis, current, whether you have current cough, whether you have a fever, which can be low grade fever, you have weight loss or night sweats. So we, and, uh, and studies have shown that in patients who are not on antiretroviral treatment, the sensitivity of these four questions of identifying active tuberculosis 
is about 80 to 90 percent. So any encounter probably in the SCD clinic or in the, uh, in the chest clinic, if we ask these four questions in a proper way where the patient can be on, this patient can understand, I think we might have a good screening tool here in a clinical basis. Now regarding the x-ray, most of the studies have shown that adding an x-ray, this is in countries like Malawi, South Africa, in poor resource settings, might not significantly improve, but it will increase the expense. But what we thought as the guideline committee is, x-ray in Sri Lanka is fortunately freely available up to now. I don't know what will happen tomorrow. Right At the moment, we don't have CT films in our hospitals. And, uh, but we might, you know, we might go through this. So, but if the x-ray is available, I think it is very important, and the guideline committee also agrees that it is very important that we should add an x-ray so, to the, uh, the diagnosis. Especially we might be, be able to diagnose a lot of uh, underlying conditions which might not be clinically apparent. So <clears throat> if, if any symptoms are not there, I will go according to that. So a person come about 28 year old patient referred by the venerologist saying that this patient is having retroviral infection. And when we ask the history of the patient, he doesn't have a significant amount of cough, fever, weight loss, or night sweats. Then the important thing is whether this patient is fit for therapy or not, IPG or not, right? So that will first depend on, even after extensive investigations, if we think that this patient is not a suitable candidate for INH therapy or rifampicin plus INH, then there is no use going down that pathway. So the first thing is, the best thing is to go for a contraindication. So if this patient is having a severe liver disease, right? if the patient is having already a severe peripheral neuropathy, or other contraindications like sensitivity to drugs, then probably we might not be able to consider him for IPT. Because giving ITP, IPT will be more harmful than not giving immunoprophylaxis. Right, so but if the patient doesn't have any contraindications, yes, certainly this patient should be considered for tuberculin well, the prophylaxis with INH. The reason is that this patient, we know that are very, has a high risk of developing tuberculosis if we don't do so. So the first investigation that we can do is uh, the MAN2, and I'm happy that we have now, a uh, developed skin test, which will be probably be coming to Sri Lanka, which are more sensitive, but a properly done MAN2, IGRA. So we have written two things here, because if you look at the literature, there are instances where, in patients with latent tuberculosis, where MAN2 can be positive, but the IGRA can be negative. And there are instances where IGRA can be positive, and the MAN2 can be negative. So if you really want to drive in your diagnosis of having tuberculosis, it's, oh, and if, the, if you have the resources, it will be always better to go for both the investigations at the same time. But if you are doing that, you have to collect blood at the time that you see the patient first while you are doing the MAN2. But uh, two years back, we thought that we will be able to do that. and. Uh, at the moment, sometimes we are struggling to give antibiotics to our patients in the wards for life-saving life uh, illnesses. Sometimes we don't have even medazolam, and there was a time when I did have IC tube uh, insert, to insert for a patient. Biopsy forceps are not functioning, so I don't know whether we can do it in a proper way. So anyway, this is the proper way that we thought that we should go on in Sri Lanka. So uh, if it is positive, Obviously, this is, it is in, in diagnosis, it's a, it's a latent tuberculosis. But if it is negative, as, I, as we previously discussed, it can be a false negativity or a true negativity, which will be discussed and dependent on the CD count, social dependent, and probably by the opinion of the consultant pharmacologist and the venerologist. If they think that this might be a false negativity, then the patient will be started on preventive treatment without any further delay. But if we think that this patient is probably having a true negative, then 
rather than starting anti-TB uh, prophylaxis, we will screen for this patient at each and every count encounter with the sym symptoms, with the clinical features that we discussed about, together with any other investigation that we deem necessary to think about active tuberculosis or latent tuberculosis, right? So, what if the patient has symptoms? Cough, fever, night sweat, weight loss. We know that HIV per se is a disease that can give rise to many, many, many other conditions rather than tuberculosis, like many um, fungal infections, atypical infections, right? So other conditions like lymphomas, lymphocytic interstitial pneumonias. So it is a risk factor for many other lung diseases as well. And these symptoms can be very nonspecific in that context. But after appropriate investigations and pre investigations, if we think that this patient is a diagnosed of tuberculosis, obviously this patient should be started on treatment for tuberculosis. And you will agree that being a pulmonology community, sometimes it's very difficult to diagnose patients with tuberculosis uh, with HIV. And the second thing is, if the patient is uh, not having tuberculosis, so after investigations, we think that this symptoms are not be not cannot be attributed to tuberculosis and we have excluded active tuberculosis then we go in the same pathway that we have went in the right side so we have a, we assess the contraindications we do the tst igra or both positive start treatment negative we go in another way so sometimes this might be the patient can be presenting with the symptoms without with another problem again if you think that the patient is not having later tuberculosis, we just monitor the patient accordingly. So that is about uh, what we do in HIV, uh, but that is what the guideline says. I know that some things need to be discussed further, and we have to keep an eye on the developments in the world, and if, if further evidence suggests, I think we should be able to change our guidelines accordingly. The ideal would be to have life, you know, uh, uh, studies, or using our patients and our resources to get a clear idea about what our outcomes are. The second part of uh, my talk is latent tuberculosis in chronic kidney disease. Now, we know that uh, chronic kidney disease has many, many stages. So we have stage one, two, three, four, in stage renal failure. And when we look at end stage renal failure, some of them have end stage renal failure only but there's other part who will be at end stage renal failure and who will be on dialysis, right? So if we not consider the stage one, two, three, if we consider end stage renal failure part four and patients with end stage renal failure four with on dialysis, hemodialysis at the moment, I think these two groups, it's a, these two groups are very important, right? So if you consider the end stage renal failure only group, they have about 10% to 15% chance of uh, developing tuberculosis, right? But if you consider the other group, the dialysis group, they have about 20 times more chance, 15 to 20 times more chance of developing tuberculosis if they have latent tuberculosis. So they have a very high risk, almost similar to HIV, to develop tuberculosis if they have already have latent tuberculosis in their bodies. And the other fact is, I think you will know that diagnosing patients with tuberculosis, with end-stage renal failure, is really challenging because most of them will be presenting as extrapulmonary tuberculosis. And sometimes, to see whether this hemorrhagic pleural effusion is of tuberculosis or a uremic or any other condition, sometimes it is rather difficult. And it is challenging to diagnose as well. So sometimes even in our context, in my stage, uh, area, in my um, hospital also, we sometimes have to go into thoracoscopic biopsies of these patients to identify whether this patient, this hemorrhagic effusion, cell count is inconclusive most of the time, unfortunately. And sometimes the ADA might not come as, as diagnostic as well. So... We have two things, whether it has underlying malignancy, because we know that these patients are prone to get malignancy more than the general population as well. 
or whether it can be tuberculosis. Because if we miss the diagnosis, they may, we might have severe consequences. And most of them will have a high ESR as well, right? So it's a challenge. So we usually go for biopsies sometimes, thoracoscopic. So extrapulmonary tuberculosis is difficult in this patient group to diagnose because the presentation is different. Hence, it is very important to identify this group as a high-risk group. And if we can do anything to prevent, we have to do prevent it. But we have a small catch here. So if we treat all the patients with stage four with INH, we know that they are prone to get peripheral neuropathies and they are already on certain drugs. We might introduce, we might have severe unwanted effects and probably our, our uh, campaign might not be able to do all of them. But if we want to highlight, because they have a 20 to, 20 per, 20 to 25 times more risk of having tuberculosis, if we plan for the dialysis patients, that is what we are suggesting now. But now, again, we have a challenge. Because in dialysis, in patients with CRF anywhere, because of the severe immune, uh, the, the, the nutritional deficiencies, because of the drugs that they take, right, and because of the interaction between the T cells, immune system, as well as the dialysis membrane, they might, they have a tendency to have more energy or pure reaction for the, the, the interdermal test as well as IGRA tests. So here, the diagnosis is, again, challenging. Especially, they have done studies after about four years of dialysis. Sometimes, even the patient who's having, having uh, latent tuberculosis, they might not give a positive quantiferone result. Right. So hence, what we suggest is that this training for latent tuberculosis should be done before the commencement of dialysis, where we will be able to identify the patients who will be at a higher risk of developing tuberculosis, not after starting dialysis, but before starting dialysis. Hence, we will be able to follow these patients up, start appropriate treatment, and then prevent these patients progressing for tuberculosis. Right? Especially in this age group, I think you will understand that clinical diagnosis is, clinical suspicion is very important. So, a person has a higher tendency to develop tuberculosis in this dialysis age group, especially if the patient is having, he's a patient is elderly, if the patient is having X-ray features suggestive of previous tuberculosis infection. Okay, and those are the two things that we might have to look for to identify these patients to see whether they are at high risk. Right? There are other features like the albumin levels, but I think clinically those two are very important to understand. So after screening, probably we might have to think about identifying them at the correct position where before the dialysis comes. So we have to have a very good conversation with our colleagues at the College of Nephrology uh, to have this going on. So uh, what we do now, right? So basically the guide is to first rule out active tuberculosis. And you will agree that many of these patients with chronic renal failure have many, many chest X-ray changes. They might have already have uh, pleural effusions. Their investigation findings might think that we might be having tuberculosis. So I think as pulmonologists, either we have to be certain at least that we might, we are not missing the diagnosis. So probably we might have to go to the extent of doing bronchoscopies and bowels doing thoracoscopies and diagnosing appropriately before starting treatment, excluding tuberculosis. Then we go for the two-step TST because these patients are already elderly and they have a reduced subcutaneous uh, uh, skin fold and sometimes because of that the reading will be anyway difficult and at the same time they have energy to the TST. So in this person, who has seen the bacteria a long time ago, even if we do it today, we might have a negative value because it has, you know, the patient's booster, the patient's result is not coming out because this patient's immune system has seen the bacteria a long time ago, right? To reduce that incidence, we do as a two-step test. Actually, we do the two-step for health workers. For example, if you do, do my mantu today and if it is negative, 
And at one year, if it becomes positive, that might indicate that I have been exposed to the tuberculous bacteria during the last one year. Or else, the, the, ma the amount that was done has boosted my immunity to give a false positive value. So because of that, usually in a healthcare worker, if it is negative at the onset, we usually do a repeat one within one to three weeks. So that we don't have the boost effect, but we will have to see the, the, the response, which was due to, if it is not due to uh, the T cells not reacting properly, then we will have a result. So if it is also negative, then it is a true negative. Right. So hopefully, I think I, you can understand why we do the two steps test. And in here, specifically in patients who are having dialysis, it is always better to have two modalities of diagnosis. So because some of them, the TS, the, 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 for the reasons that we discussed above, doing only a man two might not be adequate in a certain instances. And the stakes are very, very high in these patients, of not diagnosing latent tuberculosis in these patients. So we usually advise to use both methods, TST and IGRA, out of which we suggest that we use the T-spot test rather than the Contiferon Gold. Because in Contiferon Gold, what we do is we measure the amount of interferon gamma, and we don't consider the amount of T-cells that are already there. So if for some reason the T-cells are already low, Due to the low T cell level, you might have an inconclusive quantiferon report. But in T spot, you you know you quantify, you see how much of the cells are producing interferon gamma. So please correct me if I'm wrong, my microbiology colleagues. But but that means that probably it can compensate even in a patient who has a low T cell value. So in these patients, it is suggested that we use the T spot value rather than the quantiferon goal, which I think it is rather cheaper than the quantiferon. Right. So if you go uh, into the, uh, the outline, basically HIV negative clinical groups, all groups, now I will concentrate on the dialysis group. The first thing is, I think the most important thing is, any patient who is on stage four disease coming to you due to another problem, not referred by the nephrologist to do a MAN2, I think it is always important to you know, identify whether this patient is having latent tuberculosis or not. That might be useful when this patient is referred back to in about two months with a pleural effusion after starting dialysis, right? So probably we have a part to play there, especially in the clean clinics as well as pulmonologists. So the second step is that basically we have to use all the modalities that are available to us in our competence to exclude active tuberculosis on these patients, right? So after that, if we think that this patient doesn't have tuberculosis, either TST or IGRA can be done. In a utopian country, we should do both. Right? So if both are negative, it is we will go back in that pathway. If either test is positive, then we have to think about this patient, whether the patient is having a latent tuberculosis. Right? Right. So if both are negative, so if one is positive, we already have diagnosed uh, tuberculosis. But if both are negative, we do the second uh, TST, and uh, that is the two-step TST. So if it is positive, yes, this patient is having uh, latent tuberculosis. But if it is negative, we closely observe the patient approximately with the, uh, the, with the shared care by the nephrologist as well as other colleagues. So I think uh, we have come to the end of the uh, presentation. And this is self-explanatory. If it is TB, you treat. If not, go in the pathway that was there in the previous ring. OK. So uh, thank you very much uh, for your kind uh, attention. And I hope that uh, we might have certain uh, problems or discussion matters that are arising. And uh, we would be able to discuss among the, uh, you know, while the discussion sessions. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, sir, for that interesting lecture.
Now may I cordially invite Dr. Bodhika Samarasekara, Consultant Respiratory Physician, to address the gathering under the topic of latent TB infection in patients taking immunosuppressive treatment and silicosis. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, let me uh, thank uh, the SLMA and uh, NPTCCD for inviting me for this presentation today. Uh, we are in an era like uh, we are uh, in 2023 that our theme is to yes, we can NTB. So it is a very important uh, topic uh, we are discussing today because we have to uh, treat certain group of individuals with latent TB uh, to achieve this target. So we are using uh, various, uh, so my topic today is to uh, talk about uh, immunosuppressive treatment and silicosis, uh, both are uh, different entities. Uh, so, we, firstly, the anti-TNF-alpha agents are used to treat uh, different group of immune-mediated uh, immune inflammatory diseases such as rheumatoid arthritis, anchispondy, psoriasis and psoriatic arthritis, inflammatory bowel disease, especially Crohn's. And we are using different group of agents like anti-TNF-alpha agents are having different ac uh, actions. Uh, commonly used drugs are like infliximab, which is a mono monoclonal antibody. Uh, Etnacept uh, is a uh, receptor antibody. Adalimumab and golimumab and sertolizumab. Uh, these are the drugs uh, frequently used uh, in uh, different diseases such as rheumatoid arthritis, inflammatory bowel disease, and psoriasis. So, um, So considering the pathophysiology of this. Sorry about that technical error. Uh, so, so we are we have we are using these immune mediated immune uh, drugs for different type of immune mediated inflammatory diseases such as rheumatoid arthritis, anchispondy, and psoriasis and psoriatic arthritis and inflammatory bowel disease. These are the drugs we are using uh, in different uh, settings: uh, monoclonal antibodies and also receptor antibodies. Uh, so, when you considering the pathophysiology of uh, uh, these agents, like we know, like along with the cytokines, TNF alpha is an important factor to kill the uh, tuberculosis bacillus in infection. So, blocking these agent, agents that can 
uh, leads to uh, activate the latent TB. So that is the simple basis of this uh, uh, pathophysiology. So what are the current evidence? Infiximab uh, reported fourfold increase in the risk of TB infections. In inflammatory bowel disease, the use of TNF-alpha inhibitors increases the relative risk of TB incidence by 2.5 folds. TB risk caused by monoclonal antibody infliximab, what they say is, is generally higher than the receptor antibody etnaset. So it is important to have a proper diagnosis and treatment of LTBI, and it is strongly recommended before initiating these anti-TNF alpha agents. So diagnosis LTBI, firstly, as in any case, it is very important to uh, uh, diagnose whether these patients are having active TB by a chest X-ray and uh, sputum, AFB and sputum culture if indicated. But as previous speakers told, like uh, it is the most important two tests are the tuberculin skin test and the EGRA test. So if you take asymptomatic patients with evidence of previous pulmonary TB on chest X-ray, these patients also need to exclude active TB. And these regarded as LTBI irrespective of their TST or EGRA after excluding active disease. For example, if, there, if you have a, a radiological evidence uh, of uh, pulmonary TB, then uh, even though you do uh, TST and EGRA, but it is uh, regarded as LTBI. So LTBI treatment is not recommended for patients who received standard adequate treatment for previous active TB. So these patients, if patients are not received, then you have to anti-TB, then you have to treat with LTBI treatment. But if they have uh, received adequate treatment, then you don't have to treat again before starting anti-TNF alpha. So when to start anti-TNF alpha? After confirmation of LTBI treatment, uh, after confirmation of LTBI, the treatment should be initiated. So start TPT in all positive TST and OEGRA patients after excluding active tuberculosis. And a TST duration more than 5 millimeter for those who are on immunomodulatory therapy are also considered as positive. So these, we know these patients are, before starting anti-TNF alpha, also like they, were, they are on different groups of uh, immunomodulatory therapies. So, uh, so we take uh, the TST in duration uh, more than 5 millimeter in these patients. So TNF alpha can be started the four weeks after initiation of LTBI treatment. So that is very important, this four week. Uh, we have to treat uh, TP, TB prophylaxis treatment at least four weeks before starting uh, TNF alpha therapy. So these patients need to be observed carefully for development of active disease. And you need to monitor closely for adverse outcomes as well. So if contacted with the PTB patient during TNF-alpha treatment, so what we can do? Again, we have to exclude active TB, and we can initiate uh, LTBI treatment, uh, and TNF-alpha could be continued while monitoring closely for uh, active TB if LTBI testing is negative. If a patient develop uh, active TB during TNF-alpha treatment, so you have to immediately stop anti-TNF-alpha treatment in this group of patients. And treatment of active TB should be started promptly, and reinitiation of TNF antagonist should be considered after two months of intensive phase with a good response. So these patients uh, you need to monitor and after starting anti-TB, uh, uh, anti after two months, uh, with proper monitoring, and if you see good response, then you can again start anti-TNF-alpha. So then there are non-anti-TNF-alpha targeted biologics also. 
So rituximab is commonly used, anti-CD20, abatacept, uh, anti-CD28, uh, tocilizumab, IL-6 inhibitor, uh, sec secuquinumab is IL-17 inhibitor, and anakinrise IL-1 inhibitor. So these are non-anti-TNF-alpha targeted bio biologics. Uh, I really appreciate the rheumatologic colleagues who are dealing with these uh, names, actually. <laughs> Tongue biting names. So, uh, so non anti TNF alpha targeted biologics, uh, if there's a risk of TB, uh, th these drugs, the risk of TB reactivation is negligible. So, need to exclude active TB again should also be screened for latent TB. However, if uh, these patients are positive for latent TB, treatment is not indicated. Why we are doing uh, screening for latent TB is like we, these patients also, we need to follow up every three months in district chest screenings. So now we know like in case of positive results for LTBI, non-anti TNF alpha biologics represent that the safest option rather than TNF alpha uh, uh, agents, biologics. My next talk on uh, silicosis. So, silicosis is a fibrosing lung disease caused by inhalation of crystalline silica. So, exposure to uh, free silica or crystalline quartz is still a major occupational hazard. So, we also have these industries uh, still in Sri Lanka, like uh, new industries as well. So people are de uh, dealing with sandblasting, um, mining, and also uh, exposure to clay and also stone and glass industries. They are at a higher risk of developing silicosis. So this leads to lung, fi leads to lung fibrosis in dose response manner after many years of exposure. Diagnosis of, uh, diagnosis of silicosis is made based on the history of exposure and it is accompanied by the clinical and radiological features consistent with the disease. Silicosis has been identified as an independent risk factor for TB. Various studies show that risk of developing TB is reported to be 2.8 to 39 times higher for the patients with silicosis than the healthy controls. So it is important to screen these patients. And the other important thing is, is diagnosis of uh, coexistence of active TB. It is very difficult to uh, differentiate these two diseases if they persist together. Diagnosis of active TB superimposed on a silicosis can, can be very difficult because they have some uh, like so upper lobe involvement, uh, both diseases and lymphadenopathy. So they have a similar uh, clinical and radiological features. So you have to be careful. What are the, we can do some additional investigations that can be performed even if sputum smears are negative. So that is expert MTB RIF, sputum TB cultures, HRCT, and bronchoscopy, ball and transbronchial biopsies you can do as additional investigation. So the patients with silicosis, uh, you have to rule out active TB and consider either doing TST or IGRA. Start TPT on all patients with positive TST or IGRA after excluding active disease. Then consider TST positive in duration more than 5 millimeter if uh, patients, uh, patients are presented with fibrotic changes on their chest x-rays. So in a nutshell, like uh, this is discussed earlier as well. Uh, so patients, I'm talking on initiating of anti-TNF-alpha treatment and the silicosis. So if you have, so you have to first screen for any uh, TB-related symptoms and with a chest x-ray. If you have symptoms, then investigate for TB. If you have TB, you have to treat TB. And if it is uh, not TB, then TST or EGRA and either test positive, then give the preventive treatment. So if it is the TST or IGRA negative, then you can do a second TST. If it is positive, again, preventive treatment. If it is negative, then you have to closely observe these patients. 
And if you don't have uh, TB related symptoms or uh, chest x ray changes, then uh, you can do TST or IGRA again. And if either test is positive, give preventive treatment. If both negative, then again do the second TST. And if it is positive, give preventive treatment. If it is negative, then observe closely. In summary, ladies and gentlemen, uh, immunomodulated treatment is very important and we have to use in many patients and to diagnose uh, LTBI these patients is equally important. Uh, so it is important to do uh, LTBI screening before starting anti-TNF alpha treatment and uh, non-anti-TNF biologics. Active TB need to be excluded before TST and IGRA. Employ both uh, modalities, TST and IGRA if possible. If positive for uh, LTBI, it is important to start uh, TPT for four weeks before initiating anti-TNF alpha. TPT is not indicated uh, before starting non-anti-TNF biologics. Discontinue anti-TNF alpha if patients develop TB during uh, TNF antagonist treatment. Uh, in silicosis, carry out careful clinical assessment and appropriate investigations if clinical suspicion of concomitant active TB and consider either TST or IGRA in these patients and start TPT on all patients with positive TST in duration more than 10 millimeter or positive IGRA. If there are fibrotic changes, uh, we can uh, start the in duration is more than five. So again, just to remind, uh, uh, yes, we can end TB if we properly catch up these TB cases, we know that during uh, corona period, we might have missed many cases and uh, latent TB also may be high. So uh, in different conditions, uh, we need to catch up these patients and treat, uh, especially before uh, starting uh, immunomoderated therapies. And if patients develop silicosis or chronic kidney disease or patients living with HIV. Thank you very much. Thank you, sir, for that informative lecture. We have come to the final, but yet another important topic for today. May I warmly invite Dr. Ishant Pereira to deliver his lecture on latent TB infection in solid organ and stem hematopoietic stem cell transplantation. Let me thank uh, <coughs> the NPCCD and the SLMA for organizing this uh, important expert talk on latent TB uh, with, together with the two college, colleges, the Sri Lanka College of Palmologists and the College of Microbiology Sri Lanka. And it's a privilege to talk in front of my colleagues and my teacher, Ma'am Jennifer Pereira. And uh, so it's a very important topic that we have come to, uh, the uh, latent TB infection in the setting of, of uh, solid and uh, hematopoietic stem cells transplant. So as you all know that uh, TB can develop in solid and HSCTs or hem uh, hematopoietic stem cells transplant patients even though they are HIV, they are HIV negative and not being, even if they are not, I mean, known to be exposed to TB patients because of their profound immune suppression which are going to uh, be there in after the transplant period and the pre-transplant settings as well. So uh, the WHO in reaching their goals of uh, ending TB by 2035 uh, identified this as also an important risk group of patients. And also they, uh, then thereafter they recommended to have our own guidelines for the member countries who are having a prevalence under 100 per 100,000. So as you all know, is a guideline is a, a set of rules or instructions given by an official body uh, telling you how to do a particular thing, especially if it is one, it is difficult. And this is really a, 
topic which is really difficult because there are various clinical and scenario settings where you may be adapting your decisions case by case uh, based on the the relevant factors <coughs> so uh, I was the coordinator for this guideline development group for the GDG of Sri Lanka and uh, to make justice to them, they were the, they were the members of uh, the group, uh, the clinicians and the WHO and the National TB program uh, uh, contributors. And uh, once we have developed the guideline, the way we did was we put it forward to the, the stakeholder groups, the transplant teams, the nephrologists, Include the rheumatologists and the mineralogists and the various subgroups and discuss widely and got their uh, inputs before implementing and getting into practice. So, what's the problem of uh, what's the, uh, the, the, the burden of uh, T bean transplant recipients? In recipients of solid organs and HSCT, they require uh, prolonged immunosuppressions and they are more prone to develop TB than any immunocompetent person. The prevalence is about 12% among these groups in TB endemic countries, and obviously it's less in the uh, developed world. And it's more with SOTs than HSCTs, and highest among the lung transplants, and among the other solid organs, it's more prevalent in the uh, renal transplants. This is more often fatal, and it is said that uh, but one third of nearly a one third of one third of SOT patients will die, and fifty percent of the patients will die of HSCT if they develop TB in the post-transplant setting. <clears throat> there are many factors which would be uh, important in the, uh, whether they would develop TB in the SOT recipients. The time of maximal immune suppression that is the first year of post-transplant period. And those who are receiving lymphocyte depleting antibodies as in the induction therapy may be in the HSCT group. And those who have had TB treated in the past, those who are having radiological evidence, whether they have had past TB or not, suggestive TB, chest x ray features, or when they were having a positive uh, immunological test on TST or IGRA or the new, newest, uh, latest uh, TBST skin test. There are other risk factors as well. The recipient associated ones like uh, old age, male gender, smoking, malnutrition, diabetes, and uh, obviously uh, chronic lung diseases, and latent TB in the past, and uh, chronic liver diseases, and autoimmune diseases, and long term dialysis, as Niranjan previously explained. And there are also uh, donor associated things like donor type, whether it's a cadaveric type, I will explain in the, in the, in the future slides. And there are social risk factors like homeless and smoking, alcohol abuse, and having more contacts with TB patients. Or there are other medical risk factors in the, di the donor also, like diabetes and low BMI and untreated. So they have to be very mindful now, although it's a very well known fact, many of them, the live donors are, may not be the real, real. The, the known patients who are going to be donating the kidneys or the solid organs for obvious reasons which you all know about. And they may not, they may be going for the transplant or do donation for obvious reasons, for economic reasons, and not divulging their facts about exposure to TB or their homelessness or their abusive, substance abusive states and all. Whether they have been in the prisons or not, they may not be coming to divulge. And they, you, as you know, in the papers and media, you all heard about various, various stories at which I'm not going to discuss about. And there are also transplant associated factors like the profound immune suppressions. And where there is uh, acute or chronic rejection, the medications you are going to be using, and all these are going to be important. Lastly, not the least, this is very important, the setting where they are living. Uh, that is the TB burden of the country or the area they are living. Maybe the, the person who is, the donor who is coming from Colombo district, you obviously know what the case burden of the Colombo district and the western province when compared to the rest of the districts. 
in the country. And also, within the district itself, there are locality, whether they are coming from a homeless or uh, shanty dwelling or whatever the place which may not be divulging to you, to the transplant team. And also, uh, there are other practical things which we mean I, we have to think about now. Whenever there is a donor found, there is a rush of blood in both the, uh, the medical the teams and also in the, the with regard to the patient also to go ahead with the transplant. Because they have been waiting for this donor for many, many years and got, got told of a donor now. They wanted to do the transplant and we don't want to, that medical teams also want to get the transplant done early before going for too many, I mean, chronic dialysis. At the same time, there are the stories where uh, somebody else is demanding the donation for, for a different reason. And uh, the, 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 the recipient may be at, I mean, very anxious to get the transplant saying they come and tell us, kind of setting. So they will go for this, all these uh, uh, urgent transplant settings for obvious reasons which we do not want to discuss openly. So why do you do the testing in the transplant set um, setting? That is one thing is to recognize the active activity between the donor and the recipient before transplant and also prevent once that if there is LTBI, once it is transplanted and the graph will get a reactivation of undetected LTBI. So how do you go about with uh, the active TB dissection, uh, detection? And as I said earlier, active TB should be ruled out first in all these settings of LTBI as we have discussed over and over again with the previous speakers. Uh, and this, this is very important, as Niranjan also said, the, the four symptoms criteria. The chronic cough, the current chronic cough more than two weeks, the loss of weight, the night sweats, and so on. And, and, uh, and the chest X evidence as initial screening tools. And you need to ask about the exposure history. If they have been living abroad, I recently had a patient in a private sector uh, the, although the, the patient is getting a transplant Sri Lankan, uh, getting transplanted in local in Sri Lanka, but have been living in another country overseas, so uh, with a low prevalent kind of setting. So the, those important factors, the travel history, or the other way also, you need to be considering. And my, the microbiology and other newer tests or other radiological tests may be important as well when you are uh, ruling out the ruling out active TB. So LTBI, LTBI is a setting where you don't have clinical TB, radiological TB, and there is no microbiological TB, but you have evidence of immunological evidence of infection in this setting. So this immunological evidence, if it is going to be subdued due to your uh, immune suppression for very, very reasons, and uh, so you need to interpret them in that context, how you are going to interpret these tests. As previous speakers talked about, you have the TSTs and EGRAS, and uh, I don't need to go into details. But in this TST reading, cutoff value is earlier also discussed. Very important practical point is to read it in, in millimeters. However much you say, we see you know, the transplant teams in various various hospitals, the may, may, I mean, teaching hospitals, maybe in Kandy, maybe in Colombo, maybe in Ragam or whatever the place. Now they do all, they all of them are having TST facilities at their at their at their at their uh, practicing institutions. They write these tests, uh, medical officer writes, and they go to the, go downstairs to the, the OPD, uh, TST or mount to test, testing room. They get the test done. One important problem is that then they don't read it in millimeters. Anything below 10 millimeters, they write it negative. Anything above 10 millimeters or 10, 
they write machine in millimeters how much we say how much i have been telling this to other my colleague sister hospital where i am close to my hospital at valisara and they still read it in negative or positive way but it have been the same it not it's not different from our hospital also being at the national center for respiratory disease and still we are struggling to get them to read it in millimeters yesterday also i had to pull my colleague dot saman kulratna also last week also we have to pull the nursing staff at, at the at the at valisara why don't you write, read it in millimeters for them below 10 is negative above 10 is positive for us five or more is important in this setting this was a, yesterday's patient also a patient with hiv positive again read it as negative and the uh, the std experts are asking us whether we have to offer tpt or not where i could not give an answer because this this is a really important thing these are all i'm talking about the practical points which we encounter daily day in and day out but uh, that has to be put into practice by the nptcd and we clinicians at the hospital levels and and even at the mdns of the transplant meetings then the, the second problem i will come with the uh, with regard to tst when i'm talking going to talk about the, uh, the igras so for immune competent patient it will be uh, more than 10 mm immunosuppressed 5 mm so obviously the donors will be immune competent the 10 mm for apply for them immunosuppressed the uh, the 5 mm will apply them but with regard to children when we were having discussions with the transplant team the hematologists and they came out of the issue some of their transplants of hsctis are done for children for a plastic anemia and various other reasons and they are the people who have been uh, vaccinated with bcg the timing with related to bcg how far from that bcg now the child is now and accordingly we need to interpret the in duration as well uh, very good point read pressed by the pediatric colleagues plus the plus the hematologists again a uh, little bit of com uh, comparisons coming uh, this has been discussed early i don't want to go into the details of it now as a programmatic guideline when we were discussing we decided to select quantiferon over t spot although they are, they are having different different advantages one for obvious reasons because this process in time of 16 hours for G, quantiferon git and t spot of 8 hours now in the years to come there may be a transplant set i don't know whether it's happening at at jaffna level and in the north but maybe in north central province and how can we get the blood transported within that hours that period of hours to the, uh, the ntrl the national tb reference laboratory at valisara given the problems of transport fuel scarcity and all these issues so or whether we are going to employ a courier and courier going to deliver it within the hours what which been speculated and all those things we have considered and since it is giving a higher time then our microbiologist dr dushani at that time suggested that we should go for 16 hour quantiferon as our, our one of our uh, pre future plans now coming back to our own setup of getting it done at the private sector now it was about when we were developing this guideline it was about 16000 rupees per test of our quantiferon but it then came to recently i was told that is about 27 28000 Uh, charge for quantiferon now now these people these patients are coming from all over the country they come to your place somebody a doctor who does who does not know about this timing and all they write all this test and give it to the patient and the family or the patient's uh, bystander they go to the closest place they say they may be sorry for mentioning few names of the laboratories not for anything maybe asked you all hey mouse or whatever the places they have their collection centers all over the country and it may not be happening twice a day collection a courier going to come from putlam to uh, uh, colombo 
they are not done in the Putlam laboratory, it is done in the local laboratory in Colombo. They are transported by these couriers. And you may have to give a word to the patient if you are going to get the sample for quantifier on please go to the Colombo center and get it done. Otherwise, the whole exercise will be wasted spending so much of money and uh, getting a, a indeterminate or borderline or whatever the results. So these are very important practical points. We as the clinicians, transplant team members and the national program to get in uh, into uh, to your thoughts when you are practicing. Then one in other important problem of IGRAS. Now when it is when the TST request is given to the patient, they go and get it done at the at the at the local uh, OPD nursing station where the amount of test is being done. Then they come back to the uh, the transplant team and nephrology team or whoever it is, and show the result. It comes as uh, in inconclusive or negative. Then they, since they have heard about the quantiferon, then they give the other test to the patient to go and get it done in the closest private sector laboratory. By the time, or they, they come back, they give the referral to the chest physician. By the time they reach us, about three weeks, four weeks have passed from the day they have placed the mantu. The problem of IGRAS is they are going to be react, responding to the some of the components of the PPD in the TST. That is why they are giving a uh, false positive IGRA test. So, somebody who has not been born to positive, who have been maybe previously really born to negative, set aside the immunosuppression which you are worried about in the transplant setting. Now, just because the trans the TST have been placed, when they go to the private sector laboratory and get it done, they get an IGRA positivity. Then you ask the timing of this that test and the, this test, and they say, then how are you going to, are you going to offer a, a LTBI treatment for this scenario? Are you going to delay the transplant with the per person has found very difficult, with difficulties, the, 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 the donor and found money for the dialysis with difficulty to continue with the twice a week or thrice a week dialysis program? So all these things have to be put into uh, the minds of transplant team down to the person who is writing or filling the forms at the most lowest level. It may be a printer who has been employed by the transplant team. So it has to be coordinated and updated each, each time when you're going for these transplant meetings. Right. <coughs> there are a few factors to be remember, remembered in uh, LTBS training. Uh, the as I said earlier, with increase in immunosuppression, decrease there is a decrease in the sense, test sensitivity. So more they are organ failed or more dialyzed, they are going to be less sensitive in the LTBI screening tests. <coughs> so screening should ideally be carried out before impending immunosuppression or, or starting, as Niranjal said, before starting dialysis, transplant or administration of immunosuppressive drugs. And moreover, if there is a setting of acute or chronic rejection, there will be more profound immune suppression going on for, for a prolonged periods. <coughs> so, for the point I raised earlier, uh, it is ideally better to do both tests at the same time. But there will be a cost factor for these poor people. Are they prepared to pay that? If if either of them are going to be positive, you consider it as positive set after leaving, I mean, uh, excluding active disease. But if after excluding, if either of them, if TST is positive, why should you go on to do a, a IGRA test, asking the patient to pay? So uh, I, the, 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 the guideline, the GDG, Guideline Development Committee suggested after uh, reviewing the evidence, to place the, I mean, get collect the blood sample between day three and seven of the, uh, the TST placement. That is, they are found that by uh, by seven day seven, 
they will not be having a tst related false positivity of at igras so uh, we suggested that we be, be performing the uh, or collecting the blood for igras at day 3 because anyway they are coming by day 3 to get the test done we need to uh, we, we discussed about it earlier also said to we need to minimize the travel time or visits to the clinic as well so better now the, now one important thing has to be communicated to the patient as well by day 3 if you are going to do the igra testing you have to get the blood sample get it processed within 16 hours for that you need money so patient has to come prepared with close to 30000 rupees next day when you are coming to the clinic for that mount reading for them to have a proper value for their t uh, igra test if you are going to do so that has to be communicated to the patient on the day where when you are placing the uh, tst at your i don't know whether it's going to happen if you are just writing a letter and uh, request form nursing of the opd please do mount to test that kind of thing so this is very important thing that has to be communicated to this transplantation teams as well okay so suppose i mean in the general settings if activity b is excluded as i said earlier clinically on four symptoms score radiological and microbiological and either of the tests of this immunological test are positive i'm just saying for the first time if not and they have not been treated for ltb or active tb disease in the past you can consider that they are the, there is a latent tb infection i said if there is if they have been treated for latent tb or active tb disease you may not consider it as a latent tb infection obviously because you have been you have treated the patient unless you may argue what how can why can't they get get tb reinfected there are possibilities that is why i said a very important least of not not the least important the locality of the patient is more very important when you are considering about the reinfection possibilities if you are going to consider it as a never latent infection or never tb infection <coughs> uh just follow the next couple of slides it will clear out most of your confusions you will be in calling and asking me uh, several times uh, the, these scenarios they are very important scenarios Be, uh, because you cannot produce a guideline for all scenarios you need to remember the principles when you remember the principles you can apply the principles to all scenarios and apply and then and then decide the what what the best pra practice to be done with regard to this case of this patient who is going to be transplanted if a patient is with prior documented history of positive tst or igra do this may be active or latent tb so you exclude active tb first but since you have already have a positive test if you have excluded activity b it should be latent tb so therefore you don't need to retest for ltbi there was also another patient who has had uh, infliximab given after ex uh, after diagnosing latent tb earlier and now coming back and they wanted to give infliximab again we excluded itt activity b whether you want to do retesting with mount when or no because we have already said there is latent tb and you have treated it then asymptomatic patients with chest x ray evidence of past tb and there is no history of adequate treatment obviously you have to exclude active tb and it is regarded that ltb i know after excluding active tb irrespective of their tst and igra results whether they are negative or positive you treat, you consider it as latent tb because you have had previous evidence of past tb <clears throat> suppose somebody who had been earlier treated for ltbi or active tb disease in any case you will have to exclude active tb so you have actively excluded active tb and there are again ltbi testing is not required because it's a immunology based testing and immunity is going to last 
but those who are having active tb suspect uh, suspected of having active tb more advanced diagnostic tests are needed this is the question uh, my my trainee malinda asked this morning also whether when they are <coughs> when they are suspected of having tb you have done all the all the tests of excluding active tb but you have a serious i mean serious clinical suspicion of the whether the patient is having active tb or not are you going to wait for the cultures can the patient wait for the cultures in this setting having an organ donor and not having enough funds to go ahead with the dialysis for another three months and the the team transplant team in a hurry to go ahead with there again you can go for other more rapid kind of uh microbiological sex testing the gene expert hrcgs and so on and there you take a clinical decision on this patient whether to go treat for or not then if it if you have slightest suspicion of active tb you need to treat the patient uh, before and we have said when you should be uh, starting the transplant if there is an emergency of transplanting while on these treatments as well So come in proper to uh, the, these two different settings how do you prepare these patients first of all you need to remember what are the settings in scenarios of occurring uh, tb disease tb disease i am saying in a transplant setting of a solid organ there could be latent tb in the candidate recipient with it's going to be re, uh, re endogenously reactivated later on there could be a latent tb infection in the donor graft when it is grafted and there could be reactivation or is this has been post transplanted you get exposed to tb from another source from your locality getting infected and coming with the tb now anyway the patient is immunosuppressed somebody is in the in, in his household infecting him or candidate is already having active tb requiring an urgent transplant that also can happen especially with regard to the uh, cadaveric transplant they have found a cadaver now going to transplant patient is having tb want to go ahead with the transplant the team want to somehow he has no donor so cadaver donor have been found they want to transplant so in this setting how you, how you are going to do so in a similar way according to the erh journals this is the best best setting you have a <coughs> patient recipient with a transplant which is disease free go ahead for free nothing nothing happens the last one was the one who was already having tb there is an urgency kind of a to get it transplanted from a good kidney he is going to get tb uh, anyway you have to treat the patient other settings the recipient that the recipient is already having latent tb you get a good transplant graft then it going to get endogenous reactivated or else the recipient is good you get a transplant with a infected latent tb latent tb you going to get this thing the last one was the one before the good transplant you got a endogenous infection so these settings are possible in all this these scenarios are there so you need to remember all these scenarios when you are uh, considering giving okay for the transplant with regard to tb right so what are the procedures to follow ruling out active tb and screening for tbi in sots you have to evaluate both donors and the candidates right that this is not happening in certain transplant settings i get patients i've been here at valley sir for the past 7 years and not i haven't got a single case single transplant where they have sent the the donor so this is a very serious thing so uh, and again don't forget about the disease donors also they are living and disease donors also right right i'm just saying these things not to uh, discredit any group their colleagues i've been telling them that we should come to the discussions with the transplant uh, 
uh, teams because sometimes they may after the transplant the transplant team may not see the problems we we see we have had two tb patients one was a young boy with uh, extra pulmonary tb coming through the chest wall through the pec major going from here and coming out as a coned lesion like a pyramid coming here and we have another patient with a similar problem now now that patient was treated with the help of us and the nephrology team and uh, the so our surgeons who trained them trained the lesions pec major getting infiltrated and uh, uh, 23 year old boy so uh, and the uh, transplant team uh, the nephrology was very the Yes, sorry about the technical delay. Anyway, so we need to uh, uh, evaluate both the both the, uh, the donors and the candidates for LTBI and active disease. So uh, when it comes to evaluation of transplant candidates. As I said earlier, it is done to detect unrecognized active TB and to prevent endogenous reactivation of undetected latent TB infection. How do you do, do a set about it? And you do the basic screening, the clinical score, sc scoring, the chest X and microbiology. It has to be negative in all patients to exclude the active TB. And here, both TST and IGRAS are done. You need to employ the two step TST. So remember when you are going to give two, two step TST and uh, you are going to do the IGRA together, how you are going to be timing it has to be very important. You have to, be, you have to remember one third of these SOTs when they get TB are going to die. That's the, that's the research, of the, the, the evidence. So it's worth spending that 27,000 for IGRA until the facilities are going to be available with the NTRL on these patients rather than spending so much of money on and time and the risk to life and rejection of the graphs. Right. So depending on the immunological status you need to read these TSTs depending on whether they have been dialyzed earlier, whether there is a TV, uh, TST conversion from negative positive as uh, Niranjan said and if you have done it before the transplant then they are going to start on hemodialysis you need to get into the the minds of the college this is the nephrology college that you need to be doing this all the patients who are going to be the kt in future kt patients to have the tsts done early other evaluations as i said if you really suspect 
clinically suspect TB or radiologically. Otherwise, you may, you may go ahead with the other evaluations depending on case by case, including HRCT where relevant. So, evaluation of the living donors is done to prevent donor transplant unrecognized active TB or LTB in the graft. Right? We have had patients who have, uh, although rare, who have had TB on, the, on active TB disease in the in the in the donor. So again, you go with the similar pattern, but the little difference is you can go with either TST or IGRAS for the donor because you don't have a problem of profound immune suppression or kind of immune suppression there. So in duration is going to be considered as more than or 10 or more millimeters. Suppose the living donor is tested positive and found to be having active TB disease, that organ should not be used. And the active TB should be treated with ATT and should be re-evaluated for active TDs. And when treatment completed or and after a period of time, you are, you are sure that this is not coming back. For example, you have given six months or eight months or whatever the treatment duration and reassess after a couple of months and see whether it is suitable for this man or woman to donate the kidney or the other organ. If it is LTBI in the donor, LTBI treatment should be considered prior to organ donation. It is advisable to complete the LTBI treatment prior to the transplant. But there again, these people are not patients. They are, they are donating kidneys for various, various reasons. If it is a just household person, your family member donating kidney and you say that you are, you are, your father is going to get TB, if you don't take this latent TB treatment, going to be a problem, then they will listen and if somebody is going to sell it for something, they may not be interested because they say, they would say, Mata le dakne, mamma kota de bhed bhani, mamma kota TB bhed bhani, and it's TB bhed, INHO or FMPC or what if offending, they are not without usual side effects starting from all the stuff you know and they, they may or may not take. Now suppose that happens. Even it is transplanted, now if it is clearly treated and transplanted, properly treated person, you may not need to give active or sorry, latent TB treatment to the recipient because you have treated properly. How can you be sure that your donor has been, has taken the del TB treatment properly for the three months or six months according to the regimen you have selected? In that case, you may have to offer LTBI treatment to the recipient, although we have though we have not put it into the guideline. So these clinical scenarios, all scenarios cannot be put into a document because things can happen out of out of the real context. Evaluation of the donor organs. How are we going to do that? Initially, it's, it's the most difficult one. And somebody has met with an R RTA. Now there are several organs to be. The six organs could be transplanted, the kid lungs, the heart, the liver, and the two kidneys. And they may be in a hurry to take these organs. When you talk about these things to the transplant team, they have not thought about it earlier. And with all respect to them, we are, they are doing a very great service in this country. And uh, they may want to evaluate, they may not want to evaluate or they may be in a rush to transplant. And the same with the donor, donor part, party. So how we are going to get about? So you, a detailed history from the donor's family or relatives. And if possible, if there are past imaging studies, may ask them to bring the, the x-rays if they have, be having something. Right. If there is a higher risk of TB, you may take respiratory samples from the diseased body. And if possible, they have recommended, although there are no evidence, I would say, there are no evidence to say that it has been done on a trial. You, obviously, you cannot do on a trial with the HRCT and things like that. It's going to be the same with the uh, evidence with the heart. With the, uh, there, there may be HRCT may be different from a uh, normal living person with uh, fluid retention and all. So HRCT. TST obviously not possible. And whether you can take a blood sample for IGRA and testing, that has also been suggested. but 
not been valid validated in a in a research setting whether it's going to be the same now when a disease body but they is going to have the same immunogenic response the t cells are they going to give the same response nobody knows so uh, when you are going to use the disease organs when near possible if possible you can do the ra radiological and microbial these things and the egress if i have suggested as suggested now but when a disease donor may have a tb risk but could not be assessed for a tbi you need to have active surveillance in the recipients on a prolonged time and provision of tpt on individual basis is suggested so that also i don't think i don't know whether they would come to you and say that we have transplanted the disease now so that is why this this very important exercise of this uh, expert talk should have should proceed from here after with the transplant team and std uh, specialists and so on to carry on with the real real message and have jointly working together you as i was suggesting to amita yesterday to arrange a college level uh, expert panels on these things okay a uh, few words about hematopoietic stem cell transplant again preparation basic screening and all those things have to be done donor tst is uh, 10 mm 5 mm for the uh, the, the, the recipient and you have to be very careful that this is maybe very very subdued response because you are dealing with blood cells which are going to be really really affected with regard to mounting uh, immune re reaction and also as i said earlier bcg vaccinated child how you are going to interpret that with the timing of the bcg and now testing and uh, here since we have lots of issues with this you may need evaluation depending on our mother microbiological samples although they may be transplanted now you may be having the cultures and other things when it comes to the results one day maybe two months time you the microbiologist will come and say tell us hi here here there is a tb culture positive on your patient who have whom we have taken the transplant the samples and the chart city may be relevant here okay so a few scenarios in a summary like so somebody who is having past tb history ltb or disease or tb disease who have been adequately treated should be evaluated for active tb will not treat pre treatment uh, for ltbi if there is a past history of tb without treatment completion should be evaluated by the palmologist and att uh, and if there is active disease you will have to give att or maybe tpt on the basis individual basis if there is only in radiological evidence of active tb still irrespective of tst and igra a full course of att is given on in uh, considered in the immunal, uh, individual basis if there is a prior document history of positive T tst igra retesting of ltbi is not indicated should be evaluated for active tb and will need treatment for ltbi similarly i would skip the slide so once ltb is detected how are going to do proceed you have to offer tb preventive therapy okay right as uh, my colleague bandu explained earlier we have three options in this country 4h uh, inh prophylaxis for 6 months daily for and 3hr hr inh and rifampicin daily for 3 months or the inh rifampicin rifapentin once daily for Three months. In this group, for obvious reason, to reduce the waiting time of the transplant, we would once it is available. I don't know whether it is available now. Rifampicin. Once it is available, we should be able to go for this regimen as the thing. Or else, you can go for uh, third one, one daily dose of uh, for the, the for one month. Hurry. The timing of treatment for LTBI. ideally ltbi treatment is done pre transplant and aiming to complete before listing for sota hscg but somebody is in a hurry to get the transplant done while receiving ltbi treatment to uh, if the potentials of uh, there is a potential benefit of transplant over in the uh, in the tb risk of tb reactivation then you may in the middle of the ltbi treatment you go ahead with the transplant once the patient is able to take take treatment orally 
you may continue the rest of the LTBI course in the post transplant period. <coughs> in the in the setting of a very urgent case, right, of as in the case of a diseased donor, you may ask them to proceed with the transplant, but ASAP you need to in the post transplant period you have to give the treatment. <coughs> so LTBI treatment is not routinely recommended for patients who have been adequately treated for active disease in the past. You presume that the patient had been treated at the active TB maybe three, four years ago. I had this patient, I, I talked about uh, the, the British lady in the private sector and has had uh, uh, active TB treatment done in UK, came here, somebody has gone and done an IGRA and he had created a big, big commotion because they were all worried that IGRA is positive, they were going to get the transplant done and whether the patient has to be given LTB treatment or active TB treatment, whatever, they are, you know, need to, you just exclude the active TB. You may take the, if you are really worried, you may do the HRCT to detect whether it is active TB or not. It may take the culture samples, even on, later on, uh, whether it is active TB or not, we, we can decide. <coughs> While on latent TB treatment, they should be observed for active disease development because they are going to get uh, in profound immune suppressive medications. And also you need to inquire about the exposures to PTB patients. Maybe they are, there's a patient in the family who has given the LTBI to him, still having, not having taken treatment and uh, active disease. So th these things have to be, in that case, you would stop the LTBI treatment briefly, reassess the patient for active TB disease. If there is active TB disease, you are giving monotherapy to the patient to prevent that. If there is no active TB in the recipient, you can proceed with the rest of the LTBI treatment. They also should be monitored at closely for adverse outcome because they are receiving many uh, medications which similar side effects or any interactions. Right. Then, then the last one, when the TB disease occurs in the transplant recipient, what are you going to do now? Now, the, the most of the time, the clinical manifestations are pulmonary TB, and it may be very odd EPTBs or disseminated TB as well, which you would not, as I said, come in TB coming on an odd place, maybe coming on a, you, have, you may not have even noticed in your entire career, then you may see different different kinds of TB patients. They are often atypical and there would be delays in di diagnosis because uh, sometimes it may not be the clinician, the specialist me seeing the patient each time when they are coming. They may be reporting various, various complaints, which since it is very atypical, you tend to ignore. So uh, that's why one possibility. So people should be sensitive about these possibilities. They can vary from the classic symptoms to unusual EP, uh, extrapulmonary organ specific manifestation. For example, in renal TB, there may be GUTAC involvements as well. GUTAC TB, you, you have to get the cultures for GU specimens, the morning samples for cultures and all. And many of them may be having constitutional symptoms that may just may be the same symptoms of the drugs or renal disease and all the things which may not be able to recognize uh, smart to be smart enough at early early level so and the available diagnosis modalities are limited in their ability to accurately diagnose whether it is active or active tb or not and very importantly since they are on immunomodulation profound immune suppression H in hiv disease their radiography manifestation may be very very vivid and may not be getting the the the, the what is expected in a normal PTB patient. So in this treatment of these patients, the first line treatment is the same as for immunocompetent patient, but you need to have a greater vigilance to look for side effects because you are treating with many other medications. And they may be having problems of uh, the drugs, TB drugs plus the immunomodulators. You may have to stop intermittently various medications for, for renal impairment, for GI effects, or maybe for skin effects, or renal effects, then your treatment duration may be prolonged. 
again they are having higher risk. I mean, if you are not trying to treat them properly, they may develop drug resistant TB again. Then again, also longer treatment durations may be required. So, <coughs> so treatment is difficult because of the drug to drug reactions. During the COVID time, also we had more problematic ones. They were having COVID transplant plus plus uh, uh, TB. We lost one patient who had. Who had been who has had a transplant just 12 years ago, nine, doing very nicely. He with us also, he, he, he may, did very well, but lately started to deteriorate and uh, could not make it. So, considering all these problems, the focus of management with regard to TB in transplant is identification and treatment of the LTBI in the pre transplant setting and on one it and identify newly acquired TB after transplant recipient. So this is in summary I, what I discussed about the endemicity is very important, immunocompromises and the LTBI and the clinical radiology, bacteriology, histopathological evidence which may need to be considered and offering preventive treatment or therapeutic treatment uh, in this setting. With that I conclude my talk on this time let me thank the on behalf of the college of pulmonologists and uh, to the slma and the npcc team thank you thank you sir for that comprehensive presentation. We have just concluded a series of impressive presentations by our panel of experts. Now the forum is open for discussion. Uh, thank you very much for all of the speakers. Uh, very uh, expert in the answer session. Most of the questions that we have have been answered and also the organizers uh, of this event. Uh, just uh, a clarification on the two-step MANTU. In whom should we do the two-step MANTU? Uh, the emphasis was on the patient with uh, chronic kidney disease. Uh, should we do the two-step MANTU in all these patients? And is there any uh, thing to guide us on the two-step MANTU? Uh, the other question is, uh, sometimes we are referred patients who are undergoing autologous bone marrow transplant. Uh, patients with uh, multiple myeloma and thalassemia. Uh, is there a place to evaluate these patients also for latent TB? With regard to your uh, second question, autologous transplant, uh, there are the uh, immunosuppression is not going to be that profound, but there may be a period of uh, preparation. So in the preparation period of, uh, there may be and uh, some of the medications and, uh, and they are anyway, uh, somewhat sub subdued the immune response with regard to TB as well. So uh, you may employ a less strict uh, uh, measures to uh, with regard to recurrence of TB here with I mean compared to the allogenic ones. Two step amount two can be done uh, in uh, various settings. Uh, if we anticipate a repeated testing in particular high risk groups such as healthcare workers, we can do two step testing. That is to ensure patient, the, the particular person is not acquired the disease uh, so before uh, the retesting. So during uh, the, uh, the first testing, I mean, uh, the, let's think that the, now we are going to test the uh, healthcare worker so that we are going to repeat the test, two-step test in one to three weeks. So that is to ensure patient is infected or not infected. If it's positive, that means that that healthcare worker is having latent TB infection. If it's negative, we are sure that a particular person is not having latent TB infection at that time. So maybe because this, this person may be retested again, again maybe next year. Uh, so in that case, uh, so if the next year test is positive, 
that means the patient, uh, the particular person acquired the disease during that particular year. So same we can apply for the immunocompromised population where there is a cutaneous energy is expected uh, that is to boost the uh, immunological reaction. Just to uh, give some notes on the, the, the how we have taken the time to develop this guideline. First we started the, the guideline in uh, way back in January 2019. Then we came the Easter bomb and country was in shattering state and we could not meet for many, many months actually. Then came the COVID epidemic and uh, so it took nearly two and a half years and the uh, college council and the presidents also changed for three times. And uh, some, of the, some of the real settings of at that time we need to consider, we, it, it was far thinking to have IGRAS in our armament as, as, a, as, a, as a screening tool. So maybe we may be updating later on. It's easy for now to go ahead. Can, I ask, a new question? Field. Can I ask a question, please, from the eminent speakers? It was a very good uh, seminar, I must say, very updating uh, all our knowledge about LTBI because we are teaching students and the medical students need to be updated on this as well. So my question is, uh, uh, with regard to BCG, it was not very definite. None of you all spoke about the TST and the duration after BCG, do you have any at least academic data or research data? On this, uh, because you said we will be interpreting the TST based uh, on the duration it's very, after. If it is closer to the BCG, I mean, if it is I mean, uh, tested maybe five year, under five years, okay. you are going to get a higher reaction to become a positive because the added on reaction is there. Yes. But if it is a child old than 10 years or 12 years, that BCG's value, I mean, that the so effect added on to the TST reaction may not be that great. So 10 years is kind of the like... 10 years, yes. Maybe kind of the unwritten than, rule, like because yes. you didn't definitely give us a duration. That's why I wanted yes. to find out. Uh, in the guideline, the pulmonary TB is diagnosed without you said, without taking bacteriology into account. Did you not say a statement like that? No. Any no. bacteriology part is not qualified. Did you say something? No. No. no, definitely okay. it has to be there. It's clinical screening, radiological screening plus microbiology. Okay, right. Uh, the other question is, in your experience or based on research data, what number of uh, IGRAS, uh, what number of TSTs are negative with IGRAS or vice versa? I mean, uh, uh, I don't whatever. Know. The, 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 the you said the IGRA is more sensitive. Was that not? Mm, or is no. it more specific? IGRA is more it specific on the context, because BCG right? and MOTTs are not counted by IGRA. I mean, not made positive. It's more specific in other words. But uh, do we know how many uh, TSTs? No, uh, uh, no definite data as such head to it uh, comparisons. Okay. And between IGRAs also with the T-spot to uh, uh, quantifron, but it is, which is superior, that is also not there, right? That is right. And uh, for example, in a kind of a transplant, one, one transplant, I Kidney or renal, kidney or liver, yeah. uh, one is better than the other one, as although there are very, very sm small reports about it. Right. So there is no head to head comparison. No, trans, no head to head is, comparison. Yeah. With the, the comparison between a grant is what is what is better. That's that what I It's also depending on the setting. Okay. That is also depending on the setting. Okay. And some of the uh, transplants, some of the organs, IDRA may be better, some may not be. So, but they were not. Uh, giving real, real evidence also. They were just some case reports like. Okay. Thank you very much once again for that uh, lovely seminar that was conducted. Uh, just skin. have uh, one question from our consultant microbiologist. First of all, thank you very much. The panel, a uh, lot of our clinical questions were sorted. Dr. Chinta, I just want to know, uh, doing this two test mantu, which is little new to us and our nursing team because one candidate came and uh, asked me whether uh, she can run the second test in the other arm. Usually we do the non-dominant. Is there any preference like that? Thank you. So uh, this, is, uh, this is a test to, you know, overcome the cutaneous ener energy so that it's better to do in the same arm uh, so because it will affect the test result. Okay.
you. Thank you very much. The antigen skin test, it is, is it a one-off one one -off test or does it have a reading like the MAR2 after a period of time? Uh, so the, the principle of the test is, uh, so it's similar to IGRA, uh, so, but the, the performance is test is more towards, more like MAN2 testing. It's that uh, the, the reading should be taken 48 hours to 72 hours after performing the test. Yeah, about the cost of uh, this uh, uh, TSVT. I think it's uh, more affordable when compared to Contiferon. So, and it's uh, produced in the serum institution in India. Uh, so, and uh, so uh, with the discussion made with them, uh, we, we, we got a positive reaction on them um, for us. Uh, so, I think we can keep a hope on that. So, because uh, the serum institution is the institution where we take all our vaccines. Uh, so if we are going to do some research or as if we are going to do some massive screening in high risk groups, so we can go for a, uh, a, a CTB, I mean, uh, so that is for cost effective reasons. And uh, the number of tests that we can offer is much more when compared to Contiferon. And uh, so we are more familiar with the skin testing. And the transportation issue is not there when compared to Contiferon. I think it will be a good option if we can in, introduce the, that test for the system. Sixteen-hour period for the blood. Why not decentralize? Because now, you know, you can decentralize the testing because for maybe Jaffna, that north central and maybe three places. So we haven't started yet, no, testing and it's very costly. Uh, we might get another machine in near future, but uh, it will be very difficult for us to with the current uh, economic crisis and all uh, to decentralize the IGRA facilities. Uh, sport, yes, we had recently, we had a discussion with, uh, regarding that, but uh, yes, so we'll try to, uh, at first we, I think we have to do a validation and all, but uh, we'll try to get that. Uh, I have one question. Uh, this is regarding HIV positive patients. Uh, when you are evaluating patients uh, for latent TB while waiting the evaluation, I hope we can start antiretroviral therapy, no? Because the newer tendency is to start the antiretroviral therapy on the same day or early initiation, preferably within one week. So uh, if the evaluation takes long time, if we can safely exclude active TB, hopefully we can start antiretroviral therapy. Now, yes. even with symptom screening, if the symptoms are negative while TB screening is been happening, we tend to start uh, antiretroviral therapy, uh, thinking about the benefits of early initiation and the possibility of defaulting treatment if they have to come over and over again. Yeah. So I think, I, uh, as we said, in, stated in the guideline, the window period we have suggested with regard to starting LTBI is within starting of I mean, detection of within three months of detection you can go ahead with starting ART yes and if the if the, uh, the liver function and other bloods are permitting to go ahead with it, with the LTBI treatment uh, within three months of diagnosis at if least. it is indicated according yes. to your new yes. guideline. And one other thing I did not touch on, uh, the LT patients, the li li liver transplant patients, there will be a different problem, set of problems because uh, offering INH and rifampicin into these patients who are having liver derangements and how how safe for you to start this thing and they have to be very, very meticulously decided upon on case by case basis. And assessment is also not very easy whether they are having 
organ specific disease because renal organ specific disease you can do the cultures and scans and everything but livers uh, anywhere they are nodular livers and uh, liver function tests are deranged and uh, but uh, most of the time it's the donors are within the same family like they and or closer closer people unlike the unlike the uh, renal ones because they don't part with they, they have the kid Thing I think uh, have the all the medical officers been sensitized about the new LPTB guideline because still we see the recommendation no. of uh, start uh, latent TB treatment for no. all patients who are referred. So uh, no, that's a failure by uh, the by by everyone, including all the I mean contributors of the guideline, and it has to go. I think this is a good step, by, but we have started today. Yeah, even at Colombo Clinic, I see all the patients who are referred to the chest medical officer get the recommendations to start uh, yeah, yeah. latent TB uh, treatment. Just uh, to cl make clarifications, earlier practice was to all, it, whether it is negative yes. or positive of yes. a latent TB and treatment. But when we were having discussions with the specialist stakeholders, your counterpart came in, uh, came up with the problem. We are getting problems with regard to INH and the interaction with the ARTs. Yes. Earlier, so, actually, the practice was to start INH first yes. and wait for two weeks. That yes. causes a significant delay in starting ART. So we decided to start ART first and then yes. to start. Even then, now, uh, according to your new guideline, mm. it will be only in selected patients. Yes. That's a good thing But when you develop a guideline to discuss with all stakeholders have on a broad, broader forum. We have had a couple of or three times discussions with all this, all the relevant specialities and they came out with this and they were a good feedback and we ultimately f decided upon going for CD4 counts and the availability yes. of CD4 yes. counts again, then again it's yes, a problem. Yes, now it's a problem, but... Uh, what are the drugs uh, which antiretrovirus which react with isoniazid? Uh, INH, it is just the uh, rise in liver enzymes is oh, the problem. Okay. Now we uh, are trying to phase out from efavirenz even. Mm. So we are treating with TDF-50C dolutegravir integrase inhibitor. That is the preferred first line regime that has a very little effect on the liver function. So it is safe to start. Uh, yeah. Isonacid, yeah. Though isonacid can cause severe liver disease, uh, it's again rare compared to rifampicin in patients. Yes. It's basically so it's the basically rifampicin that uh, can cause the interactions with the PI. Okay. I'm sorry, uh, saying talking most of the time. <laughs> May one important step forward to get the other other stakeholders sensitized. May I suggest that in your national uh, conferences or the by the by the uh, by the STD colleagues, their yeah. annual congresses or transplant consult surgeons, annual congress or nephrology conferences, discuss this as a topic. Yes. That can, uh, one of us Maybe can come can, and... Uh, we can organize a meeting to sensitize yeah. our, from our part, but we generally follow the recommendation given either by the chest MO who is coming to our unit or the chest physicians who will be seeing patients. So if that is uh, basically coming from your side, we will be following that. Thank you. Uh, excuse me, sir. There is a question in the Zoom chat box. Uh, what is the current value for IGRA, the cost, and where it is available locally? Current cost of IGRA test. So currently, IGRA uh, is available in private sector and it's. Uh, it's a quite expensive test. I would say it's be between uh, thirty thousand and forty thousand rupees, uh, Sri Lankan rupees. Uh, so, uh, IGRA testing will be offered for patient management by the uh, by uh, NPTCCD and through National TB Reference Laboratory, Valisra, this year. So we are uh, waiting to introduce the test soon. So we have to decide which groups of patients we are going to offer and whom uh, because of the expensiveness, uh, so, um, the authorization level, and the interpretation of test results. Sir, another uh, practical scenario, sir. 
uh, we take this TST positive when the patient is having either 6 mm or sometimes we encounter patients with about 15 20 uh, mostly the uh, hivs and then sometimes in that case instances we do uh, go ahead with hr series and all and even we found it's negative so and uh, so then we ask about the cd4 count so most of them it, it, it may not available and in uh, like in in future like in sometimes those patients with having had the high uh, tsts come with positive tb so what are the like uh, experiences you had passed in these scenarios yeah uh, anyway these things we can't give uh, we can't include in guidelines obviously uh, these things are happening uh, uh, in occasional situations uh, if you have a high positive amount i think still we cannot be treating the patient without uh, clear diagnosis uh, i think these patients um, depending on the, you may have to consider other factors how you know compromised they are and what is the grade of the level of exposure from the community and uh, other status of the patient and then you would decide now this if, if you think the bacilli are in the downward trend right, in this patient is going to be very immunocompetent very soon of course, you might consider giving uh, prophylactic treatment. But if you think the patient's uh, future outcome is not very good and it's going to go down, um, and you are not going to expect much of a prognosis in this patient, well, you would go ahead and treat the patient. It's highly individualized, I think. Highly individualized. Excuse me, one more question. Uh, uh, regarding the two-step mount again, uh, so uh, can't uh, mount to test uh, mount an immune response or uh, when you do the two-step, it's uh, just uh, boost the effect and uh, the latent TB infection. Like uh, doing a mount to, uh, is it possible to mount an uh, immune reaction? So uh, the two, uh, the idea of uh, the aim of two st step testing is the to avoid the cutaneous energy. So uh, it won't mount the, uh, the uh, you know, it won't mount a new positive. It won't. So that is uh, so that is to confirm this particular patient having LTB infection or not before doing the next test, maybe in future. So it won't, I um, mean, uh, because, uh, you know, the, if we uh, do only one test, uh, so if we don't do the uh, two-step test in one to three weeks, and we left the patient uh, um, labeled as negative, and uh, that, that uh, boosting can give rise to positive result maybe in one year. So that patient may be fall into the category of a new aqua acquiring the disease, newly acquired disease during that particular period to avoid that confusion and to make sure there is uh, no cutaneous energy that the, it's, if it's true negative or true positive. Th so that's why we are going for a two-step testing. Yeah, yeah, having... Yeah. yeah, it is said that the, yes, yes, madam, it is said that the, uh, the uh, post positive IGRA result could generate with the previous TST, post positive result after seven days. So, yeah, but, uh, Yes, uh, 
No, I think it's the same. The TST and the ICRAS, it's the same thing happening, or I mean, at the molecular level, what's happening? I don't know. So, uh, that's what they have uh, mentioned on the, the two step. They would have done large scale field level research, operational research. Then they will consider not only the immunology but the transport issues, fridge, uh, and whether the patient will, whether whether it's patient friendly. All those things are considered in operational research. Probably that's why this three week is given. Forty thousand, thirty thousand. They cannot cost. We straight away go for the uh, two step one. Yes, at least we have at least some evidence to say. I mean, negate the possibility of cutaneous energy in transplant patients. And about the duration of uh, preventive treatment uh, in post transplant patients and uh, uh, people living with HIV. Uh, so how long should we go? It's, uh, for LTBI treatment, we are going for six months or three months. Yes. But uh, for the patients, uh, we are giving us uh, preventive treatment. Uh, uh, I couldn't get your question. Yeah, the, for LTBI infection, we are treating for six months. So those yes. uh, we are treating as preventive treatment, like uh, uh, immunocompromised patient. Um, especially in solid organ transplant and people living with HIV. Uh, uh, you mean latent TB cases? No. Yeah, immunocompromised H patients, we are... Yeah. HIV TB patients? No, HIV patients, yeah. uh, we are in a, in a, being a moderately prevalent country for uh, TB. Yeah. So, uh, like Madam said, they, after after several years, they may reinfect, reacquire the uh, infection, not the disease. Uh, so, in that mm. case, how long should we uh, give preventive therapy? Yeah, the thing is now, earlier when we did not have retroviral therapy, I don't know, I'm ask, answering your question really. Re when we did not have retroviral treatment for HIV patients, once you give is isoniazid for six months, people were expecting at least for two years they are safe. By end of two years, probably these are AIDS defined. If they have AIDS, they are feeling illness, they already they are dead by two years. So maximum three years. But now with the retroviral treatment being available, they leave. Uh, then uh, once you give them isoniazid preventive therapy, once their immunity is back, uh, the, the risk is minimum. You, you don't have to give it them again if their CD4 systems are normal. Uh, but you will be closely monitoring them uh, for the disease. But I don't think that now there are recommendation to give repeated courses of isoniazid. Have I? They are having a very exposure-like setting. They even go up to the level of 36 months of offering INH. If they are not profoundly immunosuppressed and living in a setting where maybe going a very handy-like places where having lots of exposures and all, they even go on to continue the treatment up to even 36 months, depending on that, with INH. Really, INH for 36 months for people living with HIV, especially those people living with HIV with positive TSTs at the total of 1,080 doses. Right. So that, that gives an answer to your Chandana's question also. Very strong positivity and all. Maybe uh, we can 
that's why we, we cannot uh, put a hard and fast role for each and every clinical scenario. As I said earlier, the locality of the patient is very important with regard to the immune level of immune suppression also. With related to silicosis and uh, latent TB, is it six months of ATT uh, isoniazid uh, prophylaxis adequate or should we extend more than that? What they recommend is six months because uh, you know it's like entity NF alpha. Like, so uh, these patients are severely immunocompromised. Uh, as you say, like uh, depending on the conditions, like with these patients, Thereafter, you have to closely monitor whether they get uh, active TB. So uh, after treating uh, with prophylaxis, then these patients need to be monitored very closely. That's what they recommend. Thank you. Two-step mantu. Uh, if a patient comes and have a negative mantra in the first time and then he uh, comes after three weeks of uh, uh, getting the first test done, then uh, what is the thing that we can do? Yeah, after three weeks of the first month two, first one is negative and then after three weeks patient comes back. <laughs> Because these things are happening actually. Yes. You may do it and you may have to interpret in the, because you cannot put it into the frame so. And when you decide then with the, the proper context whether you are going to offer INH or, the, or otherwise, that has to be decided then and there. Okay. That is where when these, these are managed by transplant teams, it's sort of a MDM level. So uh, there you uh, discuss all your possibilities and all and decide, uh, probably I would uh, consider as, say day 21 is uh, the cutoff. Patient comes on the day 22, are you going to say no? So, or I have no quarter when I say no. So you may have to take a decision then and they are clinical. You are, we are clinicians in no way. Defaulters of prophylaxis, whether you are going to offer, you asked the same question yesterday to uh, I, I mean, IPT, whether you are going to offer to the recipient. Uh, the don donor defaulting, as many times we may come across, which they may not die well that they have defaulted this. Thank you all for your very enthusiastic participation. I would like to uh, take this opportunity to thank uh, Professor Jennifer Pereira, Madam, for your enthusiastic participation as well. And also, I would like to thank all the panelists for shedding light on the topic of LTBI. Now, we have come to the end of today's proceedings. May I invite Dr. Ruantika Karyakaravana to deliver the vote of thanks. Very good afternoon to all of you. Latent TB infection management guideline was developed in 2021 as a collaborative effort of NPCCD with most of the colleges, mainly Sri Lankan College of Pulmonologists, which I believe today is one of the milestone in the pathway of Im implementation of the LTBI guideline in Sri Lanka. First of all, I would like to thank Dr. Vinaya Arya Ratna, the president of Sri Lankan Medical Association and all of their staff on behalf of NPCCD for agreeing to collaborate with us to organize the expert talk on LTBI management implementation. 
I would also like to thank the speakers, Dr. Bandhu Gunasena, Dr. Niranjan Disanayaka, Dr. Bodhika Samarasekara, Dr. Eshan Perera, Dr. Onali Rajpaksha, Dr. Chinta Karuna Sekara, sirs and madams for, all, for, for your elaborative lectures and very fruitful discussions, and especially for spending your valuable time for us. A special thanks goes to Sri Lankan College of Palmonologists for their continuous support in uh, most of our events throughout. I like to thank uh, all the college representatives, institutional representatives, and all the participants who are present here, and also those who are joining with us virtually today. Your participation ensured the success of our event. I personally would like to thank Dr. Lahiru for all the effort and support given while organizing this event, and Dr. Suvani Pereira for your comparing. Also, I would like to uh, give a small reminder that exactly after one month from today, we are coming across the World TB Day 2023 with the theme of Yes, We Can End TB. Share Oge Turankaramu O Apita Puluva. With all of that, thank you and have a pleasant day. Thank you, Dr. Ruantika. I invite you all to collect your lunch on your way out. Thank you all for your keen participation. Wish you all a great weekend ahead. Thank you.